Uh, we're going to call this meeting to order. <laughs> I'm going to call this meeting to order. Uh, so the first thing is to review and approve the agenda. Uh, so there were a couple of changes we were going to make. Um, one is uh, we had a request to move up the uh, winter parking ban ordinance amendment up second public hearing um, for Sibley and Prospect Street. Um, so unless there's an uh, objection, we thought well, we might move that one up uh, to right after item six, right after the appointment uh, to the transportation, actually, transportation infrastructure committee. Do we need to have item six? Okay, no, so I think you did that last uh, time. We did the last time. So we're going to take item six off the list. <coughs> um, and then I, th um, I know there are this roads are bad, and I'm not sure if anything else got shifted or canceled. I well, I think if you want to have Mike Miller here for, <coughs> is Mike still here, or did he already leave? He already left. Yeah. So um, he was. So if you want to delay the the river, depends if you want him here for the river stuff. The river had more questions. Right for him, yeah, because he had had a treacherous drive ahead of him. Well, regardless, I think we'll have the public hearing. Sure. We just may not be able to answer all the questions okay. when that comes up. Beautiful. Um, okay, so I think that's it. Were there any other um, thoughts about changing the agenda? Okay. Um, so um, with that, we'll consider the uh, agenda approved. So on to general business and appearances. This is an opportunity for any member of the public to uh, address the council on any issue other than what is on our our regular agenda. I have one. You have one. Go Unless ahead. Unless there's others first. Well, uh, just to finish that thought, uh, if you have something you want to say, um, if you'd come up and say your name and uh, where you live uh, and try to keep your comments to two minutes or less, that would be excellent. But go ahead. I just wanted to introduce to the council and the public our new finance director, Kelly Murphy, who will be starting January 6th officially. Kelly is a Montpelier resident, so decided to come and listen to our budget presentation. So it's our last chance for her to complain before the, <laughs> the actual, she actually has to be on the other side. Uh, no, we're really excited about having her come. She's got a background in municipal government and state government and budgeting, and um, we're really looking forward to having her on board. So along with all the other new people coming on board. Yeah. All right, well, we're psyched to have you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, any other any other uh, comments from the public? Yeah, I, if you'd come up to the mic so uh, you can be on the record here and people at home can hear you. Okay. Uh, Laura Rose Abbott, I'm on Prospect Street. I'm just concerned about all the interim zoning adoptions with kind of this, well, we have to do it in two years. And I just, um, you know, you're, you're stating you're doing it because of certain projects. And without the public input, I just wonder if this opens the city up to things that could be problematic. Thank you. Thank you. It's Laura, right? Yes. Laura Rose. Um, I would love to email with you about that, just some answers to your questions. OK, thank you. Uh, anyone else? OK, so uh, moving on then. Uh, so we have a, a special. A resolution that uh, we're going to, what's that? Oh, I was skipping the consent agenda. OK. Uh, so <laughs> that first. Uh, so uh, uh, right, is there a motion regarding the consent agenda? Move the consent agenda. Second. Just so you all know, I added a phrase that I dropped onto the minutes to the one-year alternate position on the Transportation Infrastructure Committee. So. And you added the name. Yeah. OK, thank you. Um, okay, so on to the uh, uh, next item, uh, which is, uh, oh, yes, You're so eager. I am, I'm so excited about it. Okay, um, so there was a motion and a second. Oh, gosh. Uh, I'll make a motion we appro approve the consent agenda as stated. <laughs> you did it? There's already been a motion and a second. Further discussion? Okay, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed. Finally. Finally. Okay. <laughs> wow. Oh, gosh. I need to get back to sleep. Okay. All right, so um, we have a. It's cold medicine. Exactly. We have a special resolution here to um, 
celebrate Kate McCarthy. Um, so uh, I know Megan Tuttle is here from the Vermont Planners Association, the president of the Vermont Planners Association, who would like to say a few words about this. Thank you, Mayor Watson, and to all the council for having us here. Um, as Mayor Watson said, my name is Megan Tuttle. I'm the president of the Vermont Planners Association, and I think you all know Kate McCarthy um, on your development review board and um, works for the Vermont Natural Resources Council and is an active member of the Vermont Planners Association and a lot of the work that we as planners do in Vermont. Um, I wanted to share really quickly just what the Vermont Planners Association is and what this award is that Kate was, um, that was granted to Kate this year. Uh, the Vermont Planners Association is a statewide nonprofit. Um, our members are made up of professional and citizen planners, as well as other allied professions and interested parties that promote good planning in Vermont. Um, we say that uh, through our membership's work, uh, we advance the art and science of planning in Vermont. Uh, the Vermont Planners Association is also one of three state organizations that make up the Northern New England chapter of the American Planning Association. We call ourselves NECAPA because that's a mouthful. Um, so we also collaborate and advance planning work with our colleagues in New Hampshire and Maine. Um, each year, both the Vermont Planners Association and NECAPA uh, have an awards program where we recognize citizen planners, professional planners. We also recognize planning efforts and the work that comes out of those planning efforts that are implemented in our communities. Um, VPA uh, recognizes all of our award winners in the spring during the legislative session by having a reception with our legislators. Uh, the NECAPA organization hosts their award ceremony in the fall at our tri-state conference. Um, so I'm here tonight on behalf of both VPA and NECAPA um, because this year Kate was nominated and was the recipient of both of our organization's Professional Planner of the Year Award. Um, the criteria for being nominated for a professional planner is someone who has a sustained contribution to the planning field someone who's worked to increase the understanding of plan planning principles, somebody who's been effective in formulating and implementing those plans, and who has generally furthered the cause of planning. Um, I'm happy to you know, announce that we selected Kate for these reasons, and I think for all of you that know her um, professionally and through her volunteer work, she definitely lives up to these principles of our award. Um, so I know the, the mayor is going to read a resolution, um, but I just want to say thank you for letting us be here. Um, as I mentioned, NECAPA does our award ceremony at our conference in the fall, and Kate, being the dedicated uh, volunteer that she is, was actually at a board retreat for the Housing and Conservation Board for the state. So she wasn't actually able to be there to accept her award. Um, so we're very grateful for you allowing us this time to recognize Kate here in her uh, home community among people that know the work that she does. Thank you. Thank you, Megan. All right. And so I'm going to uh, read this uh, resolution. All right. OK. So thank you. For, for being up here. Okay, so, uh, whereas Kate McCarthy is the Sustainable Communities Program Director for the Vermont Natural Resources Council, VNRC, and whereas Kate's work at VNRC focuses on building sustainable, compact communities with the goal of providing residents and transporta with transportation, housing, and employment options, while also supporting the state's working lands, natural areas, and wildlife habitat, and whereas Kate is a member of the American Planning Association, the American Institute of Certified Planners, and the Vermont Planners Association, where she served for six years on the executive committee, and whereas Kate was also appointed by the Vermont Speaker of the House to serve on the state's Housing and Conservation Board, and serves as the vice chair of the Montpelier Development Review Board, and whereas many know Kate's work as planner, advocate, researcher, an educator who has had a far-reaching impact on statewide land use policy in Vermont and beyond through her, through her work with the legislature, elected boards and commissions, regional and local planners, and other nonprofit and advocacy organizations. And whereas, Kate continues to have an impact on state-level policies by providing new data and helping guide discussions on critical issues such as land use planning, transportation, climate change, systems management, and resource protection. And whereas, Kate has been successful in increasing the understanding of these issues among professional planners 
lay citizens, and elected officials, and advancing land use planning in the state by working closely with representatives and planners at all levels across Vermont, and whereas Kate is recognized by her peers for her unique and much needed style as an advocacy planner, someone who sees the long-term picture and advocates for policies that are necessary to keep our social, environmental, and economic systems healthy. And whereas Kate is careful with information, patient in educating the public, passionate about creating a better world, and is one of the bright stars in the Vermont professional planning community. And whereas for all of these reasons in 2019, Kate was selected as the Professional Planner of the Year by both the Vermont Planners Association and the Northern New England chapter of the American Planning Association. Now therefore be it resolved that <laughs> Mayor Ann Watson congratulates Kate McCarthy on being named Professional Planner of the Year by her professional peers and thanks, for her, uh, and thanks her for her commitment to Montpelier and all of Vermont's communities. Thank you so much, Kate. Um, thank you all. That is so very nice. You know, it was a surprise to hear that I received this honor from my peers across northern New England. That, that really uh, meant a whole lot to me. But then to be recognized in my community um, is really particularly special. And um, I, I was wondering <clears throat> beforehand, talking with Megan, what, what the resolution might say, and maybe I would learn some things. Um, and I appreciate, I appreciate the insights you've given me um, in, into my work, and I will, I will strive to continue to achieve those. Um, I also want to say I'm grateful that I've been able to grow as a planner by virtue of service on the Development Review Board right here in Montpelier. So really nice connection. Uh, it's really an honor to be part of a profession uh, where I get to work on these issues of human communities and the natural environment, making great places. A lot of that's really epitomized by the work that all of us do in Montpelier. I'm glad to be a part of it, and it's very kind of you to say all those nice things and take time this evening. So thank you very much. Thank you, Kate. Thank you. All right, so we had moved uh, the winter parking ban ordinance uh, public hearing uh, up to uh, this uh, slot. So <coughs> um, with that, we're going to open the second public hearing uh, on the potential uh, changes for um, Sibley Ave and Prospect Street. Uh, anything you want to add about that? I, think I don't know if I have anything I want to add. I know our staff is here. We left last week. We were going to look at... I. I believe our folks were going to take another look at both Sibley and Prospect to see uh, if they had any changes in recommendations or not. And I, I don't know. I, I assume they would. Uh, I, I believe they're here to, to talk up to this topic if they have anything they want to add. Um, sure, I'll, I can speak first on Prospect Street. And our recommendation um, after taking a look at Prospect Street was to um, exclude or have no parking from school ave to hill street and allow parking from northfield to school ave that opens up that bottom section i think the request was f by one and two prospect i think it's better to, to identify it by street so from northfield to school ave um take that out of the the uh, total ban. yes right. and have from school ave to hill street within the ban Uh, so, representing Public Works, um, we would agree with that recommendation. Um, we would suggest one other um, situation in which we move. There's a sign on Prospect Street that um, prohibits parking to the curb um, in the intersection. And we'd like to move that back six to eight feet. Just um, There's more than enough room there. That's not a deal breaker <laughs> for us. We just think that in the winter months, it would be helpful to have that be a little bit tighter away from the intersection. Okay. Yeah, 
Thanks for that. I, on that last point, are we talking about the intersection with Prospect and Northfield? Yes. Okay. Yes. So, oh, so uh, shifting the no parking sign farther away from that intersection yes. so that people don't park too close to it. Yes. That makes sense. And the other question, um, the language has been a little confusing for me uh, in some of this, but what I understood was that there's also an exception to the ban on the south side of Prospect Street between numbers 35 and 51 that's being proposed. Is that correct? <coughs> yes. Yeah. So all of Prospect would be under the ban with the exceptions of the chunk between Northfield and School Avenue and one section on the south side between 31 and 51. Okay. Okay. Good. Just making sure that we're both on the same page. Uh, Donna, uh, do you, uh, and your engineers are okay with that section. Okay. Yes. Uh, my question had to do: Is there an actual besides listing the street? Is there a map enclosed at all? When you, for these for these that are banned twenty four hours a day, you know, for the whole winter. So we have a map of. Of the, that shows where parking is never allowed during the winter, and we so would the sec this. sections of Prospect Street would be added to that map. Well, some of it already is right, but you would be able to look at it right. and see this part is and this part. Correct. A map just helps me right. more than the numbers sometimes. Who knows if the house number is seeable? But okay, mm -hmm. yeah, we'll good. The maps. Yeah. <laughs> uh, one question that had been raised previously was um, looking at. Uh, adding locations where people could park during a parking ban? Uh, is the, uh, did you all, uh, you or the the, maps? was that? Oh, well, so the, that's the section down below on Prospect. Well, there was, there was a, a request last time to have more spaces um, near, the, um, near Prospect Street. I'm not sure how close you could get necessarily. I wondered if, that, if anyone had looked into that. I'd also asked about um, uh, the spaces outside of Allen Lumber as being places where people could park during a parking ban. I don't know if that anybody looked into that either. We looked into it. The, the information we got was that most of those are filled pretty early in the morning now by people. Um, and I think if the concern, so I think the real decision has to be, uh, I don't know yet if we're ready to weigh in on Sibley, <laughs> one of the concerns uh, about Sibley parking was that even just walking from up above to down below was a concern. So coming all the way over from Stonecutters or mm -hmm. Allen Lumber was a much longer walk. Mm -hmm. um, so was that even going to meet that yeah, need? Yeah. Um, and so if, depending on what we choose to do on Sibley, I think. Mm -hmm. we, we, and there wasn't necessarily a place closer to Prospect that presented itself? Well, so this, the bottom part of Prospect oh, but, between yeah, one, and one, one and two, we've opened that, we've, we've opened that all okay. back up. That was in the ban before, right. but not. It, but if there is a winter parking ban, that wouldn't be a place where people could go. No, but that's not the case now. Right, right. Just trying to think of like how to expand those opportunities. Right. Yeah. Uh, Donna, I thought maybe the gentleman may be here who talked. There was some snow storage area that I thought someone asked us to make available for parking. Uh, like you, a bump you, out. Were, yeah, some sort of bump out that, anyway, do you, that ended up in the winter, the snow got piled there, and they were wondering if that could be cleared out so that could be a parking area. Maybe I can speak to that. I think that uh, I mentioned that as a possibility. One of, one of my constituents had, had suggested both that little bulb out on Prospect Street and the section between Northfield and um, School Ave as potential exceptions, further exceptions to the ban. Um, my understanding was that uh, that bulb out is really useful on Prospect Street as a place to store snow. And if we, um, if we don't have that, it's not a very, there's not much other place you could put it. So I think that that may, n my understanding in the last conversations I had was that that was not a possibility. That's our recommendation. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I mean, is it is it possible to clear that out like after a storm? Like you put it there during the storm, but 
but after the storm, it could be cleared out and used. Tom? And Bob? I think it becomes a challenging promise to make, given the nature of the winter, storms, what other things we have to do. Um, and so we're, we're very hesitant to make that promise that we would clear it out, given its, um, its purpose um, in that area. And I understand that um, you know parking is an issue, but I don't think that we could guarantee that we would be able to meet that requirement um, within a certain period of time on a regular basis. But do you haul snow away from other places on a regular basis after a storm? So I'm just trying to see what's the difference if, if you're doing <coughs> clearance. Well, when we haul snow from okay. other places, it's it's usually in a concentrated area. I mean, we to send up the whole snow removal operation for that one bulb light on a very okay. narrow street okay. is not the same as clearing out the whole downtown or the whole of Berry Street or, okay. uh, you know, they're very large vehicles and yeah. it's it's a no, that's kind of a that's, convoy that's type That's very helpful to know. I didn't have that image in my head. So thank you. Oh, Ashley. Um, the only, I guess this is more of a general commentary, but I, I understand that, it, you know, as in life, these things come up. You know, we make changes and it's challenging to sort of foresee what, um, you know, what, what other changes might need to happen as a result. Um, but what stands out to me, uh, particularly as a renter, and I'm incredibly grateful that I have parking right now, but um, for the folks that don't, who do rent, if the council and or the city would agree to sort of presenting these in a, in a much more um, anticipatory format, I think, moving forward, so that folks who don't have off-street parking um, are able to, you know, look at other options that are available or, you know, plan their lives accordingly, um, I, I think that that would, uh, I think that that would alleviate a lot of a lot of these <coughs> sort of reactions to something that is going to be a significant shift over time. And you know, I, I know that you have to lease parking spaces in some instances. When I lived in Boston, you know, you were leasing them for like double my salary for a year, which um, I can't imagine being reality anywhere. But um, I think that if we were to set this up in such a way that before the ban went into place, people would have an opportunity to secure parking or to, frankly, to, to move, because for some, that's a, that's a really important um, decision component to uh, where to live. Um, but if we set a deadline for next year, you know, of addressing these in maybe like October or September, if, you know, based on what we have seen and observed this year, people would then have an opportunity to weigh in on it earlier on in the process uh, and would then have an opportunity to sort of do this feedback with city staff about this rather than, you know, I, I just drove over here in like a, a whiteout. Um, but it, it just, it strikes me that um, I, I appreciate the city's needs, but I also appreciate the sort of give and take of being a renter in a community where you're you're sort of renting something with, with this understanding and then it transitions through no fault of the landlord or anyone else's transitions to um, something else it just strikes me as sort of a fundamental equity and fairness issue to to be more mindful of how we time this um, going forward thank you um, well I want to make sure that we um, are able to hear from the public too so if uh, there's any members of the public who want to come speak to this um, now's a good time don't forget to say your name and where you live and uh, Try to keep your comments relatively short if you can. Yeah. Hi, my name's uh, Thomas Moore, Prospect Street. Um, the, the biggest problem <coughs> last year was um, the snow banks. They just came in so much. You only had room for just one vehicle to get down. And it, it was a real problem. <coughs> um, like if you had a fuel delivery, UPS guy, or any any type of delivery there they were stopped right there you had to wait you know and if it was an oil guy you had to wait you had to wait you had to wait now if i had to call bob you know he wouldn't be able to get there and a, a lot of a lot of times there was uh you know just coming out of my driveway 
I'd have to come down, and it was like a three-point turn to get out of there. It was very, very narrow. And um, going down the street, if I came upon another car, he would have to back up, or I would have to back up, or go up into somebody's driveway. I've been living there 27 years now, and we've never had a problem like what it was last year, in my eyes. I, I recognized it. We always had the city garage come with a, a big snowblower, and they cleared the snow banks about three times a year. Last year, not once. Not once. And I was really PO'd, you know, because that was a real pain. You get UPS there, and, you know, you just want to go. And you couldn't go anywhere. And um, I just think, you know, you clear these snow banks and everything you know, serve our street a little bit, maybe we won't have these problems. And then if you're saying about parking down by Northfield Street and School Street for people on Prospect Street, it's already taken by number two Prospect Street, the housing authority there. Their employees take up all those parking places there. I mean, it's public parking, but you might as well say it belongs to to Prospect Street, all those parkings. And they even park on School, school Ave, or is it Street? School Ave. Ave. And that's even a pain in the summertime when you got all those people trying to come down the hill of Prospect and go on to School Ave. They're right out to the corner. And that, you know, I don't know. I just think you gotta remove our snow. You know, you do it for the bike pass, but you're not doing it for my street. And they did it like three times a year. Three times a year, they had a machine that would just clean it right off, and they'd get all the dibbits and everything. So if I had people visiting, they had a place to even park for an hour or whatever, right by my house. So all you got to do is clear my snow, and you've got you know the problem solved. Thank you. Hi, I'm Heather Corey. I live on Sibley Ave. Um, I have a few questions. I'm still a little unclear. Is this, for Sibley Ave, Lower Sibley, is this a full winter parking ban for all day or just at night? Um, I'm also a little confused. Uh, if this is for the purposes of snow removal, why we need a full winter parking ban and just not continue as a as needed basis. It snowed the past couple days and we haven't had a winter parking ban at all. Um, and I'm also wondering where, again, we are supposed to park. And I'm also wondering why is this happening now? It like Ms. Hall said, Hill, it's a it's a pretty poor time to put a full winter parking ban into effect. Um, I think a more appropriate time for that discussion as far as a renter is concerned is the typical renting season, like closer to June. At this point, leases are already signed and um, I don't have off-street parking. Thank you. Thanks. Um, do you want to answer it? I think we can answer a couple of them. Uh, the, the winter parking ban is really only from 1 a.m. to 6 or 7, whatever, 7. So it's not daytime. Um, it was intended to be a full ban at that section of Sibley. And it was raised, did get raised by residents in the area last spring or summer. And when we were preparing the stuff this fall, we missed it. And then it got raised again. So we went and added and brought it up now. Um, but in fairness to the, the <coughs> folks that were concerned about it, they did bring it to our attention. So we looked at it and said, yeah, we should probably add it. I don't know if it's, I, speaking for myself, I don't know if everyone else, if, if we were to d delay the decision on Sibley, we, it's been that way for the last two or three years, till at least till summer or spring. I don't know that we'd have a huge problem, but I'd defer to the safety folks. Yeah, and um, we did receive some comments um, this afternoon. On, if, if everyone got to see them from uh, the police, from Captain Martell, who recommended that we we do put that ban on for from a safety standpoint okay. because of the steepness and the narrow narrowness. 
So from College to Barry, that lower section, um, the comments we received t this afternoon from the uh, police is it to do that. Um, we also, um, we went over there, fire, um, one night, I don't remember what, one night this week, and it, it is difficult there to, um, for emergency vehicles. And, and we don't, ha you know, we don't have snow banks yet, but as we start to get snow banks and it, um, so our recommendation, and, and I'll speak for Public Works also, I got the mic, is that we, um, <laughs> that we do put a ban on Sibley Avenue from College to Barry. That's that's our recommendation. Thank you. Hi, my name is Kathleen Burrows, and I own the house at 35 Prospect Street. I have for the past 35 years. <laughs> I've lived there, um, and I have mostly rented exclusively to family, although um, I have had other non-family members there over the last few years. Currently, my daughter and my grandson, who's three, live upstairs, and then I have a non-family member that lives downstairs. So I'm very, very familiar with the property, and I lived there for many years. And never have I had the experience that I did last year. Last winter was horrible. I appreciate your recommendation. I love it. I think I agree with Tom. The snow banks were horrible last year. My car personally got sideswiped three times. I use Myers trash removal. I wanted to count today. I stopped at number 10. At least 10 times last year, they could not. They called and said, we can't get up Prospect Street. We'll, we'll get you next week. And that's, that's a real problem. Um, it's a problem for me as a landlord, as a tenant. You know, now you have trash sitting down in a snowbank. You got animals. It, it was just a real problem in addition to the safety concerns because, like Tom said, if the UPS guy came, forget it. I use... Um, I get my propane from Gillespie's. They take up the road. I do have off-street parking for four cars, um, but last year was the first time ever that we had people parking in my driveway, parking on my lawn, obstructing. I, I, I've never had to call the Montpelier Police Department for regulatory stuff as I did last year. They're pretty much on speed dial. And that's a really sad thing when you can't keep people off your personal property um, because they're desperate for where to park. And once the ordinance was made and the sign put up in front of my lilac bush that said you can park from here to two houses down, it was like carte blanche and they people went wild. Now I understand what you said about being a tenant or buying a condo. Um, there have been changes on Prospect Street over the past few years that decisions were made to help bring people in long-term <laughs> residences. And I, I just feel like there wasn't the foresight. You know, if you buy a condo a couple of doors down that only has parking for one car and you're a two-car family, what are you gonna do, you know? I know a few years ago when I was uh, going through a change in my life and trying to figure out if I could do a little daycare at 35, um, I went down to the pizza shop and said, would you mind if we parked here? They were very open to that. They said it would actually help business because people would see cars and think, oh, that's where I want to go. And I'm like, well, that's all I'm looking for. <laughs> so there might be opportunities outside of the box um, than, you know, parking somewhere. And it, Tom's right. Number two takes up all those parking spots, but really only during the day, from what I can tell. I usually bring my grandson home at night, and by 6 o'clock, 5.30, it's pretty much open down there. Um, whether you want to park there and walk up is a whole nother story. But I think there is that availability there. 
But from a safety standpoint and from my car and my grandson, I, I would love your recommendation to go forward and not allow parking from, you know, Cherry Avenue down because it's just, it was miserable and I'm not a complaining person, but when my car got sideswiped for the third time and my daughters and my tenants, and they're like, whoa, you said this was kind of a quiet street. And plus it does open up there, but if you come off hill, it's really skinny, and then there's that straightaway, and boom, they fly. And that was how my car got hit twice, is they just kind of got going a little too fast, slipped, and then boom, my car. So anyways, that's my two cents. Hi, I'm Stephanie Cohen. I own, with my husband, uh, 46 and 48 Prospect Street. It's a duplex. We have two parking spaces. We have four cars, typically. Anytime we've ever rented to people and had ourselves included, it's always been at least four cars. Um, I would say that we depend on on-street parking to appeal to renters. Um, I think it would be um, a disservice to, to them and to us to to not have access to that most days of the week. Um, part of my concern with only having access to one and two, um, if it were removed from the rest of the street, is um, that it would rely on people being <coughs> fully able-bodied. Um, there's a giant hill that even when the sidewalk is maintained, to go up that hill um, to get to the to the residential part of Prospect Street, it is very icy and slippery, um, and I would like to hear what plans are in place. Um, there's not really a way to maneuver if you even have a broken ankle um, to get you know to move your car and then get back to your house in these months. So. I just want to put that out there. Can you clarify your question? So my question is exactly what is the proposal? I'm, I'm still not completely clear. Is it, is it just the evenings and um, every evening between Labor Day and Memorial Day, approximately? It's, it's between November 15 and April 1. OK. Um, and I think the, the question, so it, you know what? What you've articulated is like what we're all struggling with as a staff and I think the council is that we, we don't want to inconvenience anybody for parking and we want people to be able to live in their homes. But um, we're also concerned with, you know, if your home needs an emergency vehicle to come to it uh, and they can't because of snow banks or parked cars and, you know, and we've heard testimony about other service vehicles and, and you know, we're in the safety business and so we're trying to figure out what the right solution is and and you know you make a great point about people being able-bodied and, and going up there and we also don't know what the answer is when we can't you know when we can't deliver you know maybe the house beyond yours we can't get to them in their time of need because cars are parked on the road and there's no room so we don't this is this is a difficult balancing of needs and I any suggestions I think would be really welcome from anybody you know we don't want to prescribe a solution we want to find one and this is this is what we came up with <laughs> doesn't mean it's it's come totally the right one but um, we don't we haven't thought of anything better how, how I'm just curious how um, did you own your property when there was a full winter band all year every year no we okay. bought it right after I think it changed yeah, I was just curious what people had done prior to that so and it um, certainly was an appeal Right, that sure. that was the case yeah. to living there ourselves, and that's the reason we went to this band yeah. was to make it easier for renters and for people to live in their homes. It's uh, so now we're trying to find the sweet spot. So, follow up question: um, Is there a minimum um, width that emergency vehicles like on a street, like to to consider it adequate access? Um, Ten foot is minimum, but. Um, 
it gets real tricky there because you had already mentioned the steep hill. So to come, you know, to try and get up that hill with a fire truck and then get bottled in and have to back down out, it's... So the way that that street goes is you go up the hill. Mm -hmm. It's pretty steep, and that's the case in the summer as well, or during the day when there's no ban in place. But then it opens up immediately to between 22 and 24 feet for the exact length that it currently stands between the two signs where you can have a temporary, you can be exempt from the van. So even, I'm just kind of putting this out there, the most narrow part of the street with mm -hmm. snow banks would be, I think, in question f for a 10-foot clearance. Um, the widest part of the street that currently is exempt, even with six feet wide for parking for a car, say, and even a couple extra feet for snowbank that maybe isn't cleared yet, um, would still give significantly more than that. So at 24 feet, we'll even say 22, because that's like the, we did some measurements. Mm -hmm. So even at 22 minus six, would give us a number that if I'm not so nervous, I'd be able to come up with more quickly. <laughs> 16, 16, minus even a generous three feet for a snowbank, which is pretty huge, but a foot and a half on either side, say, would still give you ample clearance for emergency vehicles in the exact spot where currently signs are posted for there to be an exemption. So I, I just want to um, make sure that we're clear on the proposal on the table because I think that uh, I think what's on the table is that that section on the south side between 35 and 51 <laughs> will be will continue to be exempt from continue the ban. to be yes okay I wasn't clear on that yeah it's. I, I have gone back and forth myself. We, we spoke about it briefly at the beginning. But yes, I believe all of Prospect Street, except for the stretch on both sides between Northfield and School Ave, and the stretch on the south side between 35 and 51. OK, great. I would like to add my nervous math <laughs> as, a, as like a, a agreement with that piece. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I know that we have a paradigm of thought right now, and I know that it is, um, we're talking about right now transitioning certain areas to no parking, but I wonder if in the future, maybe the, the shift becomes, we know that these areas are problem areas, and we are going to come up with some sort of like zone for snow removal or, you know, so priority areas, that, that would be, what, I'm just going to use an example, but zone one, um, and all of that area, you know, will be, that's first priority, that's high priority, so I would envision, you know, um, State Street, Main Street, uh, Memorial, Northfield Street, um, you know, any place where there's going to be a lot of traffic, so that those areas are cleaned first, but also what that would allow is as as the city moves from tier to tier, people would be able to actually move their vehicles in such a way on occasion that um, it, it may not result in such a significant disruption because those sort of downtown artery areas would already be cleared so that you know the parking lot back here might be more accessible. It would be you know a, a less of a disruption. Um, I, I know that's not the paradigm that we're operating in, but I always like to see Sometimes I find that my own perspective on something is the problem. And so um, maybe shifting from a snow removal plan as opposed to a parking plan when it snows is, is sort of the, the shift that it might take to find a more, you know, a way to address all of the needs that are being articulated as opposed to like car versus snow. That's an interesting idea. Uh, I'm Scott Sabatino. I own Six Sibley Ave with my brother. Um, we've owned it for the past five or so years. So we took ownership just as the full parking ban was uh, leaving. And we were thankful for that. I'll echo the last landlord's uh, statement that uh, 
on street parking is certainly something that appeals to tenants that we can uh, it's it helps us get tenants in for sure um, if uh, I can echo everybody in that last winter was really bad and that snow removal was a problem uh, and I think it's in everyone's best interest to have snow removed from Sibley Ave, but there's a lot of days between November and April where there's no snow on the ground. And to say no parking for that complete period of time it doesn't make sense. Uh, but if snow removal is the issue, then perhaps we can do an extended ban for certain areas where, you know, the parking ban goes into effect and when everyone else comes out of it, if they still need time to clear snow off that street, you know, Sibley Ave can be backlogged by two days or, or there's some delayed ban that goes into effect and it gives the public works time to clear that snow out so that we can all park against the sidewalk. So, thank you. Thank you. Well, before you come up again, is there anyone who hasn't spoken yet that would like to? Hi, I'm Valerie Lewis, and I live at 1 Sabin Street and um, maintain my mother's home at 8 and 10 Sibley. Um, you all heard what I had to say last week, so I'm not going to take a lot of your time. Um, it, just for me, it's a safety issue, and if we can find some other way to deal with it, uh, that's, that's great. Um, I think there is enough parking at the top of the hill, but uh, I did do a little research uh, between meetings and did check on some of the other streets where there is a full-time parking ban. Uh, for example, uh, Downing Street is almost exclusively rental properties. Um, and it seems to me that that's comparable. Uh, it's a little narrower, but it doesn't have the wicked curve. So I would just ask you to consider it from uh, an issue of safety and anything that we can do that makes everybody happy would be great. And thank you and happy holidays to everybody. Good evening, uh, Stephen Cohen, 46 and 48 Prospect Street. Um, I have a question. I'm kind of unclear as to what's actually changing on Prospect Street at this point because we currently have an exemption between those two signs, 300 feet. Uh, during the period between November 15th and April 1st. Um, there's always parking on that south side. So are we saying that there's no parking during the day on the rest of the street? Is that what the proposal is? I feel like I've heard a lot of different things. I was unaware that that was, that the exemption on the south side still stands based on this proposal. I thought that that was leaving as of last week. So I'm unclear as to what is actually up for change on Prospect Street. I'm gonna leave that too. I'd, I'd have to take a look. I'm not sure. I'm, I was surprised tonight also to hear the exemption. <laughs> so maybe we should clarify that before we do anything. Because that's uh, honestly I what I came last week to. I actually understood it the way you understood it, yep. adding that side. And then, okay. But then the clarification tonight was that we weren't, so I'd like to be sure. Great. Um, uh, I'd love clarification on that. Um, uh, and I'd also just echo other Prospect Street residents um, feelings about it, whether they feel on one side or the other that uh, we should extend the ban and that uh, I think, you know, either way, it's not a parking issue, it's a snow removal issue. Um, I don't have the uh, historical perspective that some of the other residents do, um, but uh, yeah, I would say last winter was really challenging. The winter before wasn't really that bad. Um, yeah, and this winter obviously has been really dry and yeah, it'd be really, um, uh, frustrating to have our renters have to schlep up and down the hill <laughs> while it's potentially um, dangerous conditions. People have to leave super early in the morning to go to work uh, to be able to access that. Um, yeah, and I would also just echo Stephanie's point about the actual street width and that with cars there or not, it's not actually kind of the crux of getting a vehicle through. Um, other points on the street make that much more challenging. Um, yeah, so again, I'd love some clarity on what we're actually talking about on Prospect Street. And other than that, thanks. Uh, Jack, go ahead and then we'll, we'll uh, have another. Yeah. Um, 
I don't think we're in we're ready to make a decision like this yet uh, tonight but one of the questions that occurred to me hearing the people talk about uh, the difficulty of parking on Prospect Street is uh, to wonder if we have uh, any policies or standards for when uh, an area would be uh, marked out as uh, resident only you know I don't want to necessarily alienate my friends who work at the State Housing Authority but <clears throat> if the problem is where do people who live on Prospect Street park, is there a standard that would lead us to conclude, well, maybe that block should be uh, for residents rather than for, uh, rather for th than for employees? And I don't know how that decision gets made, but I know there are other areas in the city where there is resident parking only. There are a couple areas. We haven't done any, <coughs> we haven't implemented any of those in the last 25 years or more. Um, I think the argument or, the, or the, the, con the point of consideration in this area would be that the housing, and somebody mentioned it already, so a resident that, um, you know, during the day people could park on the street. So people that live up the hill could use their street and the, and if the, if the housing authority people are using it during the day, fine. If they're cleared out at night and it's overnight parking. So I don't know that it would necessarily be a conflict in, in that situation. Um, I think, you know, we, we've got to, we've got to look at, um, you know, uh, what's the best combination of practices here. To okay, thanks. <coughs> Do you have something? I, do, I just, I, I apologize for having to step out. It was work related, but um, it, sort of in conjunction with the tail end of, of the last conversation I came in on, um, you know, after living in a city for a long time, whenever uh, it seems like areas are designated parking areas, um, there are eager beavers who park their car there super early and leave it there for a really long time. Um, and I appreciate the convenience that that can provide, but I, I know that we're talking about other parking locations for folks, but I just want to be mindful that um, if, if residents that are going to be impacted by this are going to need access to those spaces that we're all talking about, I think we have to have another policy that says like, you know, you, I, you can't park here all day and just sort of leave your car indefinitely in, in this space because these are for you know, nighttime resident parking um, and in areas that I've lived where they haven't sort of made that explicitly clear, it literally translated to driving around for hours trying to find somewhere to leave your car. And I appreciate that we are not a city of millions, um, but I remember that with a surprising degree of rage still <laughs> at the number of hours of my life that I spent in uh, the city of Boston trying to find places to leave my vehicle in snow emergencies. Um, and so I, if we are going to sort of have other parking areas that are available, the city has to have some sort of, of policy or designation that this is not intended to be like a leave it indefinitely spot. This is intended to be either a parking space used for day and then you know, departure so that our residents can utilize parking. Um, I just, that's, uh, that is always everywhere that I've seen that done. It, that's always been kind of an unintended <laughs> consequence that those spots end up getting filled by people who are not impacted by changes. Go ahead. Hi, my name is Terry Galfetti. I live at 4 Sibley Avenue. Um, Sibley's not a narrow street. It's actually probably relatively wide considering other streets. We may have a tricky corner and it might be slick, um, but are only because of the incline, but there's other streets that have a more steep incline that may be slicker. Um, I don't see where the it's not wide enough for any sort of safety uh, equipment to get up there only because only unless it's slick but other roads are slick as well again it's not a narrow street it's fairly wide considering most look, looking at all the other streets so I'm not really sure what the safety issue is for the road um, that's just my two cents on the on the street and the parking matter thank you okay did you want to it does have a, sure here we go Post recommendations from the 
east side, we're actually, and we're, it's just to make sure that accommodate the, it's for the fire and public works. I mean, I just want to be, be clear, because I mean, our job is to enforce whatever the policy wishes are so we can do the best <coughs> that we can, and we're trying to make this work for everybody. And so I just want to be clear, there's no, the police side of it, it's, this isn't based on accident. I mean, information, it's based on can the fire department get, you know, effectively operate and get to residents, as well as how DPW and what capacity they have to, in a, you know, from a time frame to manage winter operations. Uh, again, you know, there's safe routes to school. That's a concern around, you know, Union, Union School and Main Street. We talked about that's one of the priorities, uh, or, you know, historically as well. So it's just, so it's really clear what the police role is. So, our, so Captain Martel's recommendation is based on the concerns raised and input from the fire and, and um, public works. That's where we're at. So I just want to, but there's no other policing issue. But I'm not there. sure okay. the snow removal is part of that because the street is so wide. Um, is there anyone else who had, has not yet spoken who would like to? Laura, did you want to speak to this? I guess this, I, I'm just wondering why the Prospect Street is brought up if it's not really changing. And I just wanted to question the notice. Like, I only got one flyer on my mailbox for this meeting. Like, you, did you mail to residents? Or how do you notify people if you are making big changes in their lives? So I'm worried about that. And just the, the premise of it, the stop sign is only like, where the stop sign is at Cherry, it's only 15 and a half feet wide. So access, that is the limit. That's how big the road is. So <coughs> we do maintain that. So anyway, those are my points just about, are you notifying people? Thank you. Thanks. Do you want We have done a variety of notices, including <laughs> the just putting them actually can't delivering them like we did for this meeting, just to be sure everyone got them. But we also do the normal public notice thing. But we did do extra for this. Hi, my name's Stephanie Quaranta. I was here last uh, last week. So um, safety really is a big concern on Sibley Avenue. And for the last 10 to 12 years, I've been there every night caring for my parents. So I am on that street. I'm probably technically one quarter owner of that house. Um, and we've been there for over 60 years. So I feel like I have a very strong history of the street. Um, the PD responded probably Two weeks ago, maybe Tony, some somebody came down College Street, hit the guardrails, spun in front of, um, you know, between 10 Sibley and, and 12. Had there been a car there, that probably would have been smashed. Um, that happens a lot. Um, heaven knows uh, we've had the ambulance many times. It's a tight street. I disagree. What happens? Snowbanks. Um, you know, our neighbors at six, great people. We're still going to be friends at the end of the night, no matter how this comes out. Um, but the snow banks, it just is not, hasn't been a priority for removal. And I think that's what happens. Without a parking ban the last two nights, I was looking tonight, what happens is the plows go around, cars are parked there. I'm sorry. And then there's like these ridges. It's going to freeze tonight. And so that adds more to it. So the cars are parked out. I too am worried at night about my car being sideswiped. But it's all about safety. It affects us as well. No matter what decision, we'll live with it and we'll all still be good neighbors. But safety really is a factor, and I say that with a lot of years' experience. Thank you. Um, as a new DPW director, that in the past we've done a much better job of removing snow, it seems, from what I'm hearing tonight. Um, I will look into that. I don't know if we changed operational priorities or not. So um, I just thought I'd put that out there and say I'll look into it. Um, I don't think that that resolves all the problems that are being discussed, but I can at least make a commitment to do that. So I am opposed to parking there. I don't, I think it may solve a problem um, on paper, but in reality, it creates more problems. And I, I, I'm really opposed to it. However, um, I do totally agree with what Ashley Hill said in that 
there were two vehicles parked in front of my house at 35 all winter long. <coughs> and I called the police department and, and I gave them the license plate, registration, one car wasn't even registered. And I'm like, people are just like parking to ditch their cars here. When they don't move for five or six days straight, you know it's exactly addressing to what she was saying. So it definitely does help somebody who needs to ditch their car, but it doesn't help the tenants who live there. But um, so I just wanted to say she has a valid point because I saw that firsthand last winter. Although for me, it may seem like it's a wide street there, but people fly over coming up the hill and they may see a wide, but last year, and it is snow removal, but it's not that wide. And if you see parked cars there, it, it's just, it, it's, it was bad. We never had this problem. I never had my car swiped until last year. And now, you know, and I'm calling the police department saying, come get these cars out of here because it's ridiculous. It's 1.30 at night. My daughter's just getting home from work and we have people parking in my driveway, pounding on her door, saying obscenities because they want their car you know, when they parked illegally, it's like, come on, you know, so it just, it, it turns into Pandora's box. So that's all I want to say. Thank yes. you. Hi. Uh, I neglected to mention that in addition to being a landlord, I've lived in that building for the past six years. And I've got two young kids, one six and one's three. And when the parking ban goes into effect, speaking to the safety end of things, that means we are parking across Barry Street somewhere. And that means two little kids, and it happened all last winter and the winter before, have to travel with their mother from somewhere, winding behind the apartments that are there, and then cross Barry Street, which if anybody's been on Barry Street, People do not drive slow, regardless of the weather, and have to cross Barry Street, and you can't see the crosswalk at all there. So it's it's a hairy spot to cross and have to come up Sibley Ave. And walking down out of there, it's the same process, except you're slipping and falling going down the sidewalk. So there's more than one side to I, I totally appreciate getting <coughs> Uh, emergency vehicles in, but there is, there are other safety concerns as well. All right, thank you. Okay, so I have um, approximately one half of a recommendation, which is that for Prospect Street, it seems like we could use some clarity um, for everybody's sake about what is being proposed. I had thought I also understood, uh, but I think it could probably be clearer. It, it is. It's. It seems like an exception to an exception, uh, and so that it just gets a little tricky. I would also. Um, well, so I. I would recommend that, at least for the Prospect Street uh, portion of this amendment, that we post another uh, public hearing where we can r really crystallize at least what is on the table, um, and actually for that, if we, if that is what the council would like to do, I would recommend that we also include a map um, that make it just very clear, especially for those of us who don't live on uh, Prospect Street and the numbers are not, um, you know, pinned to a certain location. I, I mean, I can look it up, but I think it would be, it'd still be helpful for the discussion. Um, as that's, that's my half of a recommendation. The other half is about um, Sibley. Uh, what is your uh, pleasure to do with that team? Would you like to also post another hearing for that? Um, would you like to make a decision about that? Um, yeah, Connor. Yeah, I'd like to move that we approve the addition of Sibley Ave from Barry Street to College Street for the winter parking plan. So that was a, mo a motion. Yep. Is there second. a second? There is a second. Um, any further discussion just about the Sibley, uh, yeah, right, about the Sibley portion um, of this amendment? Yes. I suggest we close the public hearing. Oh, thank you. We're going to officially close the public hearing. Good call. Um, any further discussion about this, just the Sibley change? Did you have I'd just like to say that we, there were, uh, speaking for myself and not 
for the full staff, but um, I feel like there were a lot of questions asked, and I'd like us to get I'd like us to get together as a team and be able to answer them um, more clearly and more effectively than we were able to tonight and uh, before you make any decisions and um, be, speak with one voice and make sure that we know what we're asking for and why and, and answer a lot of the questions that were asked uh, about. I mean, there were good points made all the way around. So, I'd, I, so personally, I'd suggest you tables. delay everything till the 8th and um, and allow us a chance to really talk this through ourselves. So uh, including the Sibley portion? Including the Sibley portion. I withdraw portion. my motion. That's so okay. Okay. Um, so uh, does that sound? seconded? Jack? Yeah, Jack seconded. <coughs> uh, so I assume then, well, does anyone else want to make a motion regarding this? And, and I want to be clear by saying that, that I'm not necessarily saying that we won't come back with the exact same recommendation, right. but I just feel it's like we need to vet it. And obviously there was confusion and there shouldn't be uh, even amongst ourselves. And we need to make sure we, we are talking to you clearly so, and yep. the public. I, um, move, Jack. I move we schedule an, another public hearing at our next meeting um, on the entire ordinance amendment as proposed. January 9th? 8th. 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 Second. Further discussion. Ashley, did you want to say something? Um, I might have a separate motion, but I have a few questions to ask of DPW. But it's not about this motion. It is. It, it could okay. be in tandem, but no. Okay. Anything about um, this motion setting another public hearing? Okay. Um, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Thank you all for coming out tonight. It is really wonderful to have such valuable um, firsthand input as to, to all these changes. We really appreciate um, your, your questions and your thoughts on all of this. So thank you again. Um, Ashley, did you have something? So um, in terms of sort of assessing <coughs> where we are after winter ends with regard to snow removal, sort of what were the problem points that were identified, um, I guess, well, I'm assuming something, so I'm going to ask before I assume. Is that something that DPW does, like kind of just a, a winter recap to figure out pressure points, things like that? Since I wasn't there, sure. um, my guess is <coughs> we, we do have ongoing. I have experience, and we do have ongoing conversations throughout the whole season. Right. So I'm assuming that by the end of the season, we do debrief and make some we actually did do a debrief this year but it was very uh, more compartmentalized right. to how do we manage the towing uh part of it because we right. so we were really addressing those problems so that was and that and as a result of what we learned there we were able to fortunately have a plan for that right so um and and so that actually segues into the next um, my proposal, and I appreciate that this is kind of on the fly, but if that review happens, um, you know, let's say, let's say, I'm just making this up right now, but if council said, you know, we would like to hear from all city departments about um, potential changes to certain streets in relation to winter parking by January, uh, the J1 in the summertime, July. <laughs> There's two J's in, in the summertime. Um, but, you know, if, if we were to say, if the council were to make a motion saying, you know, or issue a directive to city staff saying, you know, we need to have all of these sort of pressure points identified by this date such that, you know, we can gather all of the information and, and, and let residents know sooner so that people can plan, um, to, to me, that would actually be the, the most prudent thing, I think, for everyone so that staff isn't, you know, kind of trying to remove the snow, scramble, figuring out who's going to do the towing because we didn't, you know, we didn't finalize that <coughs> earlier on because we're all so busy and have a whole bunch of stuff going and there's lots of moving parts. Um, but I think that could help alleviate some of the tension between the competing interests that are all really important but also give everyone a meaningful opportunity to weigh in and to prepare as opposed to sort of being forced into having to make a change without any anything in advance. I guess so, just for clarity, I, the towing piece, it wasn't uh, a matter of, um, yes, you it, know, it was yeah. a matter of. I got this. Yeah. Okay. No, I, I, I know. I'm I, I, so I, I would like to say we did do an update with the council and I think it was May or June. Mm -hmm. 
about this, the parking ban and the challenges and the issues, and we certainly be happy to do that again. And to what I think what Tony was going to say, the the unfortunately this fall, uh, and this is the council knows this, but people here don't, is we were not sure we were going to be able to secure a towing contractor <laughs> at all um, because last year had been so busy. Um, people were not interested in the business and so actually the choice so it's actually good we're having this conversation because the choice we're really facing was going back to a full winter ban because we had no way to re to remove cars and if you can't tag and tow then then you can't do the interim ban so while this is difficult and while this is challenging I suspect for most of you it's still better than a full winter ban and so we weren't able to look at the specifics. And then when it, it started, we went back to looking at the, the choke points. And um, so absolutely point well taken. And that's why I want to make sure we're looking at this more carefully before we do this. But it's it's a balance all the time. I mean, it, it's, it's not just a regulation that's made in this room. There's people out there with tow trucks in the middle of the night that have to find a place to, to put the vehicles. Um, we used to have three towers. Two of them said too much work. You know that we do work for AAA. We can't do this anymore. Uh, so we're we're at sometimes at the mercy of things that are out of the city's control. So I guess at, at this point I'll make a motion that um, that we would direct uh, the city manager to have city staff get a, a report, you know, about snow removal, identified issues over the summer months, whether it's June or July, that then can be brought to council you know as soon as possible from there and and I know I know that life happens and I know firsthand how busy city government work is but I also appreciate like I would be super anxious I'm just going to be real about it I'd be super anxious if you know I have a, an apartment here in town and I have to work late which I often do and you know I run the risk then of having to walk to my house somewhere which I don't feel safe doing even though I live in Montpelier and that's a byproduct of my own life experiences and I accept that. Um, but I, I would be really apprehensive about this in my own life if, if I were going to be impacted by this and I'm grateful that people are, are taking some time to sort of think about this more but I, I, I know that we are where we are right now but I like to think going forward how we can improve on this and it just seems like having you know a, a definitive thing on a calendar that says you know oh hey this is on a, this is you know we're paying attention to this and then residents can also you know make their reports also about concerns that they may have that maybe didn't rise to a level during the season but um, it just I, I know that this can be a significant anxiety and stress point for folks and I think if all of us could avoid any more anxiety or stress than we already have to navigate on a day-to-day -day basis, that would be preferable for me. So I would move that um, we direct city staff to um, report to the council by, I would say by the end of July, um, in relation to snow removal issues, and then that uh, that be on, at least as a, as a topic of discussion um, in an August or a September meeting so that people have time to plan. Is there a second? A second. Um, do you have any comments on that? Can do. It, that that is doable. Sure. Yeah, we did it in May this year. Okay, uh, done. Well, they did do a report, but circumstances <laughs> changed. But I think the problem and is. So, so let's let Donna finish. Sure. Thank so. You. so I mean, they did a report at the time, whether it was May or June, because I know at that time, you know, we didn't know all the results of the cost yet, but this whole aspect of not having a towing company, because the volume is so much, people are not cooperating with this temporary ban. It's very disappointing. And so we are overwhelmed with the time of staff as well as the towing company, and so it was the very last minute that we got one. And I think in looking at it deeper, saying, oh, if you don't have a towing company, what else can we look at? I think that was a deeper look that came up with then, let's look at these streets. Mm -hmm. So that's all. Thank yeah, you. no, and I, I totally, I understand all of that, but what I want is also something for residents to know about because you know folks who are going, I mean, they're gonna be the ones who, I mean, will all be impacted by it, but those who, you know, at least in my life experience, it seems that, you know, 
seemingly minimal changes to some of us can actually be significantly disruptive, you know, for others and um, giving people the, the sort of certainty of knowing that we can anticipate as the public to hear about this and then, you know, folks can engage with that as they may. Certainly can't force anyone to participate or pay attention, but um, it just, it strikes, it, it seems to me to strike a better balance than, you know, being reactionary right now while we're trying to, you know, navigate moving pieces and parts and there's a lot of confusion about what proposals are and aren't. It just seems to me like if we are able to, and be candid about it, you know, this, this is a fluid process because life changes moment to moment, but um, I, I think that that could avoid a lot of the sort of like back and, and forth that we're doing now trying to get this right when we're trying to make a decision as snow is falling. Okay, there is a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? Okay, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? I think that was, I think that passed. Okay, all right. Thank you. Um, all right, so we are going to move on then. Um, so now we are up to uh, the presentation from the Kellogg, thank you all, by the way, um, to the Kellogg Hubbard Library um, about their budget. So uh, welcome. Hello, I'm Carolyn Brennan. I'm one of two uh, newish co-directors at the Kellogg Hubbard Library. Um, my counterpart at the library is Jesse Lynn, but I have here with me tonight Rachel Muse, who is one of the city council uh, nominees to our <coughs> board of trustees. Um, and I'm here tonight primarily to ask that we be added to the warning for town meeting uh, in the same amount that we requested last year, and that's 350000 four hundred and seventy one dollars um, and while I was here I, I don't want to take up too much of your time but I thought I would share uh, a couple of highlights of the from the library in this past year we had a uh, we had a very busy year uh, we've started in the past couple years using door counters to count how many folks come in and visit the library on a daily basis and so last year we saw two hundred and one thousand uh, visits and that was uh, pretty steady from the year prior. We also, if you include uh, ebook and audiobook downloads and our physical circulation counts and uh, online database use, we saw over 300,000 circulations at the library. Uh, so we are just we are just hopping all the time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and we we really offer too many services to put in a one-page report for the annual report or, or to present in, in any full capacity um, to the council. But uh, in this past year, we did, uh, we did a few really exciting things. Uh, our, our former executive director, Tom McCone, retired after five years of service. Uh, and we used that as an opportunity to restructure the way we manage the library. So we went from 2.75 uh, FTE administrators down to two. Uh, and so uh, and our, in our co-directorship, we're kind of separate but equal. And Jesse uh, manages the, the uh, budget and the nonprofit end of things and our uh, beautiful 125-year-old building and the 20-year-old addition. And then I get to do all, I say, I get to do all of the fun stuff. <laughs> uh, so I get to do the library service end of things. So anything that is programmatic at the library, anything that deals with the development and advancement of our collection, anything that deals with our computers or technology, that's in my bailiwick. So, um, so that's kind of how we have split things out. Uh, this year, we also implemented a new cataloging system at the library, and that's it's it's called a um, integrated library system, and so it manages the organization of our collection, but it also manages how patrons interact with our collection, how they search for items and find things in the library and place holds and renew their renew their items and all of the all of the pieces where where we interact and manage our collection. And so our um, we were really excited about that upgrade. It brings us in line with the system that's being used by the Vermont Department of Libraries. We're now on the same system that they're on. Uh, and it's the same system that we use for our interlibrary loan system throughout the state of Vermont with the way we relate with other libraries. Uh, and it builds capacity for us to be able to improve technology in other places in the library and the way that some of our other technology pieces communicate to our cataloging system. So that was exciting for me as a techie. Um, we are also 98% uh, of the way to our goal 
uh, in a capital fundraising campaign. So that we're calling that the Give the Library a Lift campaign. Uh, we have a $600,000 goal. And um, we are going to use that to complete some larger projects that fall outside of our regular operating budget and to establish a, or improve a maintenance reserve fund that will put us in good stead for future big projects. We, we think about things like when we have to replace the roof on the library that's now 20 years old and some of those other things. So if we have a maintenance reserve, that puts us in really good stead to do that. Um, so I am happy to answer any questions that the council has. Oh, uh, Connor and Jack. Yeah, no, I'm just uh, cognizant that we have the Homelessness Task Force presenting yeah. shortly after this. And, yeah. and I have a friend up in Burlington who works at the library there. Yeah. And she was saying, like, you know, a library is much more than just leasing out books, obviously. Yep. It's a bit of a sanctuary for some people. And I appreciated Ashley raising this point last year. Yep, that's you know, true. I think it's a place where, you know, children can feel safe at the end of the day if they have nowhere else to go. Yeah. So I'd be just interested in your uh, perspective on, you know, if you've seen an increase or an uptick on people who are sort of just, you know, finding a safe place to, to stay sure. at the library at the end of the day? So we definitely do see people who are currently experiencing homelessness in the library uh, on, on a day-to-day -day basis. And we try to be <coughs> upfront with the things like the behavioral expectations in the library so that everyone can access our services equally. Um, so we do, we, we definitely see people come in, we see people use the library as a sanctuary of all kinds. Uh, and this year has, has been a pretty good year so far. A couple of years ago, we struggled a little bit more with, um, uh, we had some larger gr groups of folks that were coming in that were having a hard time interacting in a positive way with the library. They, um, and, but what I've seen happen last year, and it's and it's stayed the same or even improved this year, is that there's a lot more coordination of services in Montpelier. So we have the warming shelters from five to eight. When another way is closed, we have another way all day long. Uh, we have the Bethany at night that opens at 8 p.m. We have um, at the coordination of the churches that are offering lunches and, extend, and extending those times. So it's. From, my, from where I sit, uh, I'm seeing that there are more options for people that are looking to eat and stay warm and find that sanctuary. So the folks that are coming into the library are, are, are welcome uh, and they, they come in and they hang out in the same way that many other people hang out. And, uh, and we haven't seen anything like an uptick in behavioral issues, uh, more so than we see. We, during the darker months of the year, we generally see an uptick in behavior issues across the board. Everybody starts to get a little bit of cabin fever, and that's, so that's not isolated to any specific group of people. Um, but it's been, it's been a pretty, pretty positive year. Yeah. I think the library is great. I remember a few years ago, or I don't know how many years ago it was, the, uh, it was made public that the, the only public library in the state that had a higher uh, circulation than Kellogg Hubbard was Fletcher Free in Burlington. Is that still the case? I believe that's still the case, yes. Yep. And that's a much larger library, so it's really <laughs> remarkable to see how much, how vibrant the Kellogg Hubbard Library is. Rachel works at Fletcher Free, mm -hmm. so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Lauren, yeah. and then Donna. Um, just a little bit building on what Connor said, um, you know, I think the library is my two kids' favorite place in town, so That's they great. love it. So and, and I know that also there's a lot of kids that go there after school. That's true. And I think, you know, be often there's been a shortage of after school care and options, mm -hmm. and I think the library staff and the library management has kind of rolled with it and really taken in this kind of community shortfall in a way that I think is really impressive and has been a service and is kind of asking too much of, of it. And, and I know that there have been you know, a change in after school opportunities and more slots and things, which is great, but I just kind of laud the library for really taking on you know another community need that was being unmet and, and really in a positive and you know, all the parents I know who, some of whom had to you know, avail themselves of that at mm -hmm. times, that it was this, like, amazing resource to have this library willing to, you know, 
take care of kids essentially um, for this window until parents can get home from work. And so it's just another another way the library has been servicing the community beyond the the books and the other resources and programming that is there. So just I, I really appreciate that. I actually I also have two middle school students at MSMS. And uh, they spend their afternoons in my office, actually. <laughs> and, um, um, but one of the things that we see about 75, give or take, uh, unattended children after school between the hours of 3 and 5 on when school's in session. Uh, and one of the things that we started for this school year, we <clears throat> worked with a private donor, actually, to renovate a space downstairs. in the, our, It's our East Montpelier room. It's our, one of our two conference spaces. And we hired a staff person on to be there in those after school hours uh, as much as our budget would currently allow. And so we have kind of another space where kids can go because what we see is um, generally the, the kids that are coming after school, they've spent their whole day sitting in a classroom and they're waiting for mom or dad to pick them up or, or their, you know, their parent or guardian to pick them up. And they don't necessarily want to sit in a silent space uh, at, or sit at all, <laughs> and, <laughs> for that matter. Uh, and so there were definitely days where it would be, um, where we would see some rising energy levels upstairs in the, in the children's <laughs> library. And having the space open up downstairs gives kids another place to crash and hang out and play a game or um, look at videos on their phones. We put some hubs down there with <laughs> headphones so we, you, multiple kids could, can listen to uh, a single device if, if that's what they want to do. And so we're trying to give as many welcoming spaces to all of the, all of the people that use the library. And we've seen a huge, it's been wonderful this mm -hmm. fall. It's been really great. And all of our spaces have been used really productively and really actively. Uh, today we had a huge crew of kids that I think they were making holiday decorations up in the children's library. And so we always try to have a focused activity and things for them to do. And uh, I mean, part of what a library does is just filling, kind of some, filling those unmet needs and being the community space where people can come and just exist. Um, and so, but yeah, I, I mean, I completely agree with you, but I'm biased. Yeah. <laughs> and if you haven't been to the library lately to see that new uh, revived space, it is so bright and fresh and clean and just has such a great energy. I really recommend stopping by and taking a visit. We'd love to show you around. Yeah, Come by absolutely. anytime. Yep. Donna. Well, along those lines, I'm glad that you're sharing more information. We have a, a Montpelier Community Foundation. Or yes. Yep. Fun, fun, yep. fun. We have a foundation too, but the fun. And within that, there's a requirement to produce certain data so mm -hmm. we can see the outcome. And here you are one of the largest entities outside of our city government with money. Yep. And yet there's no like written report. So do you have an annual report you make? We used to get at least some data of Montpelier users or uh, the distribution of other money that you get from other communities. So if you have anything like that, I'd love to have some real data of I users. Do. So I brought our 2019 annual report. We're starting to get low on copies of that, but I do have it, I believe I also have it electronically. Um, so you are welcome to keep that copy and that does give some more information. You can share. And you can share it. And if, and if you guys would like an electronic copy, I'll see about sending that along as well. So like here it says 52% is municipal funding. That's correct. And of that, how much is Montpelier and other communities? Um, well, I would have to go back and look. You don't have to give it to me. Right, oh, if you could just look I that can, up. Yeah, I can look it and up. And likewise, your along. users, your distribution of users. Yeah, sure. I mean, I, and I'd love to know, like, um, you have some programs, but they're, you, you don't really list them here, but at least you have some data of sure. uh, types. But, like, how, how many kids do really, individual? I mean, one of the things that the community fund does is ask for unique individuals, not just their visits. Yeah. But that's a nice comparison. Like, you have this many members, you have this many kids with cards, and you have sure, this yeah. many visits, however you take your data, those kind of comparisons. I would appreciate that. Um, I just want to make a note. I think they sent us that information in I email. I didn't see it in my packet. I, I didn't see anything. It wasn't in the online... Um, attachments. I sent it because I sent it individually at the end of last week. Uh, I, bel I, I, gosh, I hope I didn't miss you, but I no, sent along a page of 
Um, I sent along a one-page report for inclusion in the annual report, and Just I sent along a page of statistics. Uh, yeah, I'd be happy to. I will. Yeah, okay, thank you. Yep. Yep. It's, it has information there, like the number of Montpelier residents with active library cards. Yeah, yeah I didn't get it. 3,000. So yeah, of course. Great, great, the number great. of children. And, and yep. stuff. Thank you. Yep. Any other comments? Uh, Glenn. Um, I should have to dig through my email, too. I think I did get it, but now I, I'm yeah. not seeing it. Uh, but I want to uh, second all of the congratulations and praise um, and mention that I've been hearing um, uh, praise from the community uh, for you and Jesse as the new director. Yeah. So congratulations on that. Thank you Thank so you. much. Yeah. And, and then also I, I, I do want to... Uh, not to put more on your, your plate, but I think it's great to have uh, as much of a, a report as as we can uh, in this period. So, you know, clearly I'm going to look in my own email. Yep. Uh, hopefully yep. I'll get Donna to share her <laughs> report too. <laughs> uh, but maybe uh, for, for, for next year, if we can get it in the in the actual Head. packet too. In the packet great. that goes out with, the, yeah. with the meeting. Yep. So uh, I... Probably going to blame myself here. Um, I probably should have forwarded this on to Jamie or um, oh, someone else. Okay. It went to everybody, but I'll forward it. It, it, yeah. it did go to everybody, but uh, just to make sure that it's in the packet. Yes. Yeah. Well, One of it's the still not on the online link. There's no, no. link to it. Right, yeah, it's, it's not. Agenda. It just went to our emails. That's all. And and one of the things that I'm still learning as a new administrator <coughs> is uh, we you know we have we serve six member towns so I'm learning all of the rules and who to send what to uh, for each community it's a little bit different for each town and um, so that's it's good for me to know uh, who needs to get what and when <laughs> always. Thank you. We can have a conversation. Yeah, we can talk about because oh, I have a sense of what they're looking for. Yep. So. Okay. Thank you. Um, well, I have, unless you had more, Glenn. No. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, I have a logistic question mm -hmm. uh, about uh, moving forward because really the ask was to put uh, this item on the ballot, um, yep. presumably without the requisite number of signatures otherwise, Please. which uh, the, the, in case folks are not aware, uh, the custom of the council has been that as long as the um, library has come in uh, the same budget uh, that we have exempted them from the um, number of uh, signatures. And so, um, I mean, my inclination would be to, to move forward with that. Um, but I, I guess my question is for you, John, do, you, do we need specific um, ballot language to be voted on to be put on the ballot? Or can we just reference last year's? Or, because it should be the same be. as last no, year's, I, right? Yeah, yeah mm -hmm. well, I mean, I, I can't do the language. But right, so, I so we, I think for tonight, all you have to do is indicate. So we'll end up drafting a warning, and okay. as long as you have, as long as we okay. know that this is going to be one of the ballot items, then we will make sure the language is on there. And, okay. and we have this amount in the budget that mm -hmm. we have, so it's not a change. For okay. Um, You'll end up approving the language when you approve the whole thing, which is sort of in total. So we could. Uh, but for now, we could um, have a motion about exempting them from the uh, number of signatures to get on the ballot. Yeah, you can even say you're going to put them on the ballot. We can just put, yeah, we can just put them yeah, on. Yeah, you just put vote. Yeah. Um, Connor. So I'll move to uh, <laughs> put the Kellogg Hubbard Library on the ballot for the uh, requested appropriation. I'll second. second. All right, for the discussion. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you so much for your work. Thank, Thank you. you. We yeah. appreciate it. We really were yeah, so grateful you. for the city's support. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Um, it is a little after 8 o'clock here. Team, would you like to keep going? Would you like to take a break? I would like to take a break. Yes. Okay. Let's take a, let's take a quick break. Uh, and so we are up to an update from the Housing Trust Fund. Welcome. Good evening, and thank you for having us. Um, I'm Polly Nickel, and along with Jen Holler, co-chair of the Housing Task Force, um, and we're here 
um, mostly to just answer any questions about the trust fund and also um, to thank you <coughs> for your past support and to request that in this year's budget um, there be level funding for the trust fund. We had a, a kind of lengthy conversation about the funding level at our last task force meeting and our, our ultimate goal is to still, um, you know, get the annual appropriation up to 150000 but we do recognize that it's a difficult budget year, so we're asking for le same funding as last year, which was 110. Um, and um, just thank you again. It's it's really been a remarkable resource. The demand is steady, both from first-time home buyers, um, and the, the city has been able to fund multifamily developments, which have given it a leg up in a very competitive state and federal funding environment. And um, a number, we know you're going to hear from the Homelessness Task Force in a little while, but um, a number of the developments funded recently do serve, in part, people who are homeless. And one of the applications that um, the city staff expects is um, for, for some of what is currently in the trust fund, um, <coughs> maybe to, to fill a budgetary gap on a building on Barry Street that Washington County Mental Health owns that um, serves formerly homeless people. So it's a great resource, and we thank you, and we hope you'll continue funding it. And Jen, has to anything add, to add? <laughs> Any questions? Oh, Donna. Just thank you for continuing to serve on this task force. It's great. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Well, thanks thank for your you. support. I, is that it? Yes. No. And, and to be clear, the amount that they're asking for is in the proposed budget. Right. So. Right there. It's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's in the they're proposed not, budget. Don't, you don't have to fight so for it. You don't have to think no, about no. it anymore. Yeah. Well, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> no. No, 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 no. Just because it's in right now doesn't mean right. it stays in. <laughs> well, I'll just make sure they know it's in. That's, that's why we're here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, thank you You're so much. Us, we know. <laughs> okay. All right, and up to the uh, Homelessness Task Force report. Welcome. Good evening. How are you? Um, good to see everybody. Um, so, um, we. Um, Thank you for the opportunity to um, listen to, um, to consider this package. Um, and we recognize the funding challenges for the city as a whole and uh, did our best to, uh, you know, be frugal in our thinking. Um, uh, think about tactical, smart tactical approaches um, that um, will address all the needs and the gaps that we're still in the process of identifying. There's some, you know, good complexity in all of this. Um, there's also a lot of good responsiveness in so many places. Um, as we've talked previously, it's very heartening. And um, um, again, we're putting forth the package. Which we understand, you know, you'll look at each <coughs> item separate, you know, as individual pieces, make the decisions that you feel are right. Um, we have some items um, for the current fiscal year. Um, uh, the first one has been discussed quite a bit amongst uh, city staff, and thanks to, to Cameron Niedermeyer and working for, for, for these items um, and talking with Bill and others. Um, it's uh, $750 um, to put in, and there's, uh, Cameron's done some shopping to and uh, Jody, who's on our task force, has uh, found some as well um, to in install lockers. We've, I think, described the need before, but basically people are out there. They need to, sleeping bags get stolen. The, you know, there are things that support their living out there um, sometimes need to be under lock and key. And so I think it's very forward thinking of the city to consider um, this solution. Um, number two is the bathrooms. Um, and uh, Cameron <coughs> did some shopping and found a, a Porta John company that would, you know, cut us a deal, um, and they would service um, the Porta Johns. 
and um, there would be two of them, one that would be accessible um, and the other one just a straight up one. And the siding would be um, spread out to try to, you know, in, you know, be in smart locations to reach people. Um, and then the, um, and then for fiscal year 21, um, we'd like to continue the, you know, the bathrooms or the, the porta johns. Um, we'd like to um, ask you to consider the what you did previously for extending the season for the shelter. Um, we did ask, and you know that was a ten thousand dollar figure for the fall and the spring. We did because that only meets about half the needs of the population, and there are people who can't, uh, don't fit within the current capacity, or have a hard time being in a congregate setting. Um, we did bump up our ass to another $5,000, and again, with your gracious consideration. Um, number three is, is the street outreach position, and um, Don can speak to this, um, and we recognize that the police are looking at a, an embedded social worker, um, and I think that's great, and I <laughs> talked with Chief Fakos um, the other day about this, and um, I talked to the street outreach person in Burlington, Tammy Buddha, and they work seamlessly with the police over there. It's considered a very successful program for the Church Street Marketplace management of that, that whole situation. A lot of thumbs up. I talked to Mark Schroeder at the Howard Center about this. Um, it's a very popular program, and it's able to meet people where they're at. And of course, there's some people, and who will, in, in certain situations, would have a very hard time being vulnerable with all their needs to somebody <coughs> associated with the police department. Um, and I understand that, you know, there's, that there's a bunch of issues around that potentially, but it's, you know, the, the point is, get, is getting people, intervening people, and get, keeping them alive, you know, keeping them out of the ER, keep, keeping them out of spiraling down even farther. Um, Don is an angel who's out there with these folks currently, and Don, I don't know if you have anything more to say on this piece. Um, you've said a lot of it, I think. Um, as Ken mentioned, there are some people who are not served by the existing services, and that doesn't mean it's the fault of either the services or the individual. Um, existing services pretty much have a responsibility to larger groups of people that they serve for their safety and the safety of their employees. Um, and they can't be effective without maintaining boundaries, which often members of this chronic population are unable to meet for, for medical reasons very often. I think, I think this, the biggest challenge here is reaching this chronic population, and part of the reason they are chronic is because they have already fallen through gaps in the system. <coughs> they also cost more in police time, emergency room time, obstruction of the public businesses and, you know, generally being more obtrusive than, than other people out there. Um, I think that it would be more effective and more cost effective for these people to be served individually. Um, and I think that both peer support and street outreach are in a unique position to do that, partly because they are not nine to five services. Their very approaches are aimed at meeting people both geographically and situationally where they are. Uh, they are often available after hours when other services are not. They can go out and find people on the streets who do not find their way into the services. There are also a lot of people who are disillusioned with the system, fearful of the system, or have gotten out of prison, have mental health issues, whatever, and often they are a lot more trusting of people that they perceive to be peers or to be out in their own, in their comfort zone, in their own setting. Um, the other thing is that often the street outreach people can have greater flexibility in dealing with these people and the unique issues that, and barriers that they face. Um, they can sort of tailor, tailor the services to fit the needs in a way that a lot of the existing services can't. Um, and I think those are the main, you know, the time, the, the place, the trust factor, and the flexibility are the main reasons that either street outreach of any kind and also also peer support, and if you combine the two, I think it's a very effective combination. <coughs> Can I ask you a question about that? Sorry, I don't want to interrupt if you were. No. Um, so particularly um, with the uh, street outreach positions, 
Uh, it reminds me of uh, another part that's in our budget, which is the um, social worker that's um, already um, in the budget uh, to be shared with Barry. What is your perception as to the differences between um, the social worker that would potentially be hired uh, through uh, that position and the street uh, uh, outreach uh, folks? And that's something that I actually need to do more research okay. in. I do. I assume that the hours would be limited to business hours. I don't know whether don't that's know. true. I don't know. Um, I, I would hope not, but it seems fairly likely. And I think part of it is that I see. I think that position would be incredibly valuable in terms of helping the police interface with difficult populations and averting crises. Mm -hmm. um, but again, that's a more it's a more expensive way to do it, and I feel like often the things that street outreach can address, they can address before they get to the point where they require emergency services and take away valuable mm -hmm. police time or emergency room time. And also, street outreach is, I think, kind of uniquely situated to find gaps in the system and to connect people. You know, it's, it's sort of a communication between mm -hmm. the people who are out there and the people who are providing the services. Well, thank you, and, um, and just to, uh, zoom out a little bit. I just want to make sure that we're operating in the same uh, understanding that we uh, don't actually have to decide on any of these numbers tonight. Um, and so it is, it's probably a worthwhile um, exercise for us to um, have those conversations uh, uh, at some other point uh, between uh, now and the, in the next uh, meeting. Does that make sense so that, so that we can have a, a clear understanding of what, how, how these things might be? different, uh, you know, between, do you, know what I'm, do you know what I'm saying? I think, I think I know what some of the advantages are both to yeah. the social worker and, again, the trust factor, the geography and the yeah. time factor, but I think looking at the, the specific <laughs> functions and the mechanics of, mm -hmm. of both the embedded social worker versus the street outreach would be really productive. Yeah. Uh, Jack. I, I agree. One of the questions I have that <clears throat> I'd like to explore <laughs> further before we finalize the budget is just that. What, what's the difference between the street worker program and the social worker program, which you know, I'm familiar with the Howard Center Street Outreach Program, and I you know for many years, Matt Parks, I think his last name was, was a Howard Center street worker, and I know that I represented clients who uh, found him to be uh, a good resource. Um, thinking in terms of other questions that uh, that occur to me that I don't expect you to necessarily have the answers right now. But one is that, Ken, when we, you and I were talking the other day, you mentioned trying to uh, get uh, Central Vermont Hospital to uh, direct some money into this effort. And so I'd be interested in uh, seeing what, uh, what they could generate because you're absolutely right. If we keep people out of the emergency department, that uh, <coughs> will be funds that, uh, you know, those uh, emergency department visits are probably Medicaid <coughs> visits, so keeping them out of the emergency department completely probably saves the hospital thousands of dollars. Um, I'd be interested in seeing how we how this proposal interacts with the state redesign of the uh, emergency uh, shelter uh, program that they're working on and uh, <coughs> and I think I'm interested in uh, some more detail or structure on the uh, $10,000 general responsiveness fund. Um, had you had you gotten to that part yet? No, no. Okay. Um, well, and before we, oh, sorry, unless you want to address some of his um, questions. And I not, don't necessarily need, need to have the answers okay. tonight. But well, I, I wondered also if Tony wanted to um, weigh in on this question or make some comment. Just going to be able to answer at least the, the first part of, of Jack's question regarding what we are looking for, and that would be a <laughs> it would be a, a certified clinician um, and this is specific to uh, again uh, I couldn't you know it was very well summed up here as far as what the expectations are meeting people where they're at uh, we're so 
so the details as far as this this you know the schedule we don't know what that looked like except for that it would be 20 hours a week would be in Montpelier or with our officers 20 hours a week in Barry City and if that that person is needed in either community if they're you know we just get them right there's an MOU essentially between Barry and Montpelier um, and it would be an employee of Washington County Mental Health meeting them where they're at is sending them to the institution so and uh, Back to you, Tony. so and then the other piece of that is somebody it would you know which, which is we don't know if it's directly going to happen or not. As far as the uh, the next, the other piece of that is that somebody that can, you know, a navigator, and that's exactly what Barry City has currently right now. And that's somebody that just can help people link them with services. We'll be able to do some of that. We anticipate, but this is going to be a clinician. Okay. Thank you. So. Um, yeah, go ahead. I think that I mean I think that's a serious need, and I think it would be very effective in a lot of circumstances. I I would hope. I don't want to assume, but I would hope that there are, there are a lot of issues that homeless people, there's a very high incidence of trauma, PTSD, and non-visible disabilities in the homeless community, and hopefully that, that is something. I know sometimes the current agencies are working sort of on a different model than that. I would assume that a, that a clinician that was brought in by the police would be very familiar with that since that's a lot of what they'd be dealing with. Um, I do know that a lot of people who do street reach, outreach have extensive training in things like domestic violence, um, mental health issues, trauma issues. Um, so. Okay. Thank you. Um, anything you wanted to add, Ken, or no? Yeah, I'm, I'm having a <coughs> little difficulty concentrating, but. Um, yeah, fair. Um, yeah, no, I, you know, uh, the model of looking like, you know, the social worker working in different towns, multiple towns, I mean, we're talking about this as well. I mean, I think there's a lot of people, like, in Burlington, they had multiple funders. They had the United Way, they had the city of Burlington, they had City Market, um, and um, I, I think the Howard Center may have been the fourth one. Um, you know, multiple towns, multiple funders, you, you know, the need is clear, um, you know, and it's good. We're all thinking in similar ways. Um, but, you know, it's, you know, peer support people reaching people where they're, they're at. And there's a trust factor. Um, there's a lot to be said for that. Yeah. So um, I do want, you know, I can move on to um, the, the general responsiveness fund, um, which, um, this um, was, uh, this is my verbiage here, I, I, um, I thought, you know, the simple notion is we're at the city level trying to advocate for our population, barking up various trees of various agencies that are all trying to do good things, but oftentimes the actual needs of the individuals don't get fully met. We're identifying gaps. There's still people out there. Um, we want the city to advocate for its population and you know and sometimes it's simple alignment and simple like efficiencies like with, there has just been this great effort with working with the food justice council and Joseph Kiefer and uh, Kathy Suskin and the different churches we finally you know and just today we're getting a card printed out with information for people of where to if you're hungry if you're if you if you need a place to sleep this is what you can do the, gen the, the AHS is restructuring the emergency housing fund, the state, the state is, and it's, to, it's bringing it back to the, down to the county level. So that's an opportunity for innovation. It's, it's, a, it's an opportunity for people, for the, need, the needs of our community to, get, to be, get more fully met, to get met when they're not, um, and maybe some more local control. Um, my personal theory is that if, if, you know, if we have some token, you know, to play financially, we can match with partners and, you know, who have more money and try to be a catalyst for some, some innovation that will get these needs met. Um, we were called out um, by Sarah Phillips of OEO. Uh, Office of Eco Ep Economic Opportunity for filling in a lot of the gaps that were needed on in this local level. 
Um, I, I, and I see our ground up approach where people, Don, uh, is, you know, it, you know, talking to Casey, talking to people on the street, everybody at our task force, we're working with each other, we're sharing ideas, we're, we are building efficiencies in the system and we're advocating for our population on a, on a greater level. So the, it is a work in progress, general responsiveness. I mean, there are gonna be things that are gonna arise, you know, um, it, it's to some degree a placeholder, but to some degree there's a very specific opportunity here, which is the, you know, the moving of this program to the local level. AHS is going to have money to, it can move around to target to get more needs met, but everybody, there's a lot of movement trying to solve this. I think one of the things that, that comes up when you, both when you implement new programs and with the existing programs when the population is not inclined to move forward and speak to people about them, you run into simple mechanical gaps in the system. Some, some, some of them fairly obvious, some of them unexpected. For instance, if you provide emergency shelter for people, it's nice if they have a way to get there so they can actually <coughs> utilize it. That wouldn't cost a lot of money, I don't think. But, you know, and it seems like a really simple thing, but there are things like that that have sort of gone unaddressed for a period of years. And I think the task force is, has been, along with street outreach, I suppose, has been in a, a unique position to be able to address this by specifically looking at these issues rather than having a single perspective you know, this is our chunk, this is what we are doing, and we do it well. We're sort of trying to look in between that. And I guess my point is that the need for a contingency or responsive fund is that these needs come up. And they may not, they may not cost a lot to <coughs> fix, but some of them are really vital to the functioning of the programs. Like, like a taxi ride. Yeah, or, or, you know, yeah, or gas money for volunteers. I mean, whenever possible, trying to minimize the expense, but it's, it's really vital that some of these needs be met, and we don't always anticipate what they're going to be. So having a, a fund that we could tap into would be really helpful. Do you have something to add, um, Ashley? I have, I have a lot of thought. I'm really excited by this. This, this has, like, I am very excited that this is something that the council is finally talking about, <coughs> but I also want to be mindful that I know it's your time to present and not necessarily my time to ask a bunch of questions or, um, so. Unless you had anything more or unless you were done, but. Um, no, I, 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 well, I think we're eager to hear your questions. Yes, we are. Okay. Um, so I cannot thank you enough for taking your time to not only Ashley, be, can you talk in your mic? sorry not only to be here tonight but also to put some clear thought and reflection into what it's going to take to actually address the unmet needs in our community and um, I know I support the social worker um, addition to MPD and BPD Barry City sorry police department um, and I definitely think exploring that sort of third um, Berlin partnership option is wonderful and worthwhile. <coughs> I would, however, encourage people to um, sort of take a step back for a second. And in my experience in law enforcement and working with um, populations who are in crisis or in transition um, or, you know, who have significant unmet needs that um, are, are chronically under or unmet. Um, I think that there can be a lot of distrust in systems. And I, well, I don't necessarily share that distrust in systems. I understand that that can be a significant barrier to entry for a lot of folks who may need services and resources. Um, and so I think from a law enforcement perspective, a social worker is also critical because there are so many components to police work that are so different than what anyone you know who watches the TV show thinks it is that officers do or prosecutors or frankly anyone involved in the criminal legal system. Um, <coughs> there are a few things that stood out to me as, as um, things that I would caution against the city endeavoring. I know that there are organizations that do provide some of these types of um, services for a one-time fee. 
um, there would be a question about maintenance. But uh, lockers, while I totally agree that having a place for folks to store and secure their belongings is critical, especially when we're talking, you know, um, when we're talking winter months or winters that go on seemingly forever. Um, however, the city assuming sort of the responsibility and upkeep for those would be an additional city liability, which is not a problem. Um, but I, I would caution that if the city were to maintain and operate these, it could create some sort of constitutional challenges as, um, as you know, often life seems to do lately. But um, in terms of, uh, you know, what the policies are, how they get used, things like that, um, I think I could, I could foresee some enforcement problems in terms of, you know, if, um, if there were ever were to be contraband and someone were to be alerted to that, sort of how that would work. And that is um, an area where uh, there's still room for litigation for sure. I'm just not sure that that is a, a an assumption of risk that the city would necessarily want to make, but there are lots of organizations that actually can help um, find local places that have storage that they may be willing to donate or things like that. I just, um, the lockers to me was something that might not be in the city's best interest to to pay for and maintain themselves. If, if, we, if the city were to pay for them and then another group were to maintain them somehow or, you know, policy creation or govern, you know, ho however those are going to be managed, there would need to be, um, from my perspective, some clear delineation about what is the city's role in that versus what is this private entity's role in that for a myriad of reasons, um, largely, you know, privacy and or criminal liability if there ever were to be a misuse of those. I'm not not saying that I anticipate that. I am just from a place of pragmatic reality. Um, I think the other piece is that bathrooms. Oh, can we pause there? Yeah. I think it might make some sense to talk about this one at a time. chunk at sure. a time, if that's okay. Yeah. So, are there other thoughts that council had on the lockers? I think my yeah, go ahead, Donna. Question that came up when I was talking to Ken was location. Do you put it in a <laughs> building? How do they have access? You put it outside. How do you keep it snow away from? Anyway, where? Um, I had some similar questions um, to Ashley, uh, just in terms of uh, what the policy would be around the maintenance of, of the lockers. Uh, as a school teacher, uh, I, mean, I know that sometimes, I, I was saying this to Ken the other day on the phone, that, uh, that uh, sometimes somebody leaves a ham sandwich in there and you have to be able to get in there and, and yeah. remove it. And so, you know, uh, what, is, what are the policies around getting in there? And I, I know that's kind of an in the, weeds kind of uh, question, but $750 on the scope of the mo types of money that we usually talk about is really not very much. And I, I see that you've got that as proposed as being in the FY20 budget, which is this year. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so, I mean, my, in, uh, if let's say we were able to come up, you, you all, or someone, we're able to come up with a uh, policy, work out if there are constitutional issues, or you know, be, work through all of all of those challenges. Come up with a, a plan. This is where we're going to put them, and these are the policies that are surround it. And then just come back and say, you know, you know, can we have seven hundred fifty dollars when all those questions are resolved? Um, th I guess that's what my advice would be about that. But yeah, question. Okay, and Councillor Hill, if you don't mind, I just have a question. Um, when you're referring to constitutional issues, are you talking about the ability to search what's in there? Search and, and, and secure against security. Privacy, things like that, right? And um, you mean the Fourth Amendment still a thing? So, so you anticipate a Thankfully need. Thankfully, in Vermont, so, the Fourth so Amendment is still. So, oh, shit. so I mean, a person puts his or her possessions into a locker, locks the door, and I mean. Is there a need to search what's in there? Well, there may be. I mean, that's right. I mean, that's sort of, and I, 
I am not saying that that would be the norm, but that is a significant question that would that would almost by definition, and it doesn't sort of matter. I mean, this this is something train. I'm sure there's plenty of litigation about this because trains, right. you, train stations used to have lockers, um, right. but when you have the, a government entity being involved, the calculus is different than it is if it's a private entity that is um, going to access the materials because there's a sandwich in there or because there's something in there. Um, and, and so I just want to be mindful that, that having the city administer that would change that calculus because it would okay. be a, a government entity rather than okay. a private entity setting policy. So we can look, look in, well, we need to dig into this. Obviously. Yeah, and I'm happy to talk further a, about that with you um, if that would be helpful. I don't, I don't know if it will make any difference or not. I just wanted to make it clear that these lockers, uh, the need for these lockers was not intended to address the situation of where people put their belongings in general, but specifically to address a constant issue of people needing sleeping bags when it is very cold outside. And there may, in some cases, uh, recently I spoke with people at Good <coughs> Sam and arranged to have sleeping bags at the shelter so that when people are asked to leave the shelter, they can hand them a sleeping bag. I got you. Okay. Which, is, which solves some of it, but not all of it. Mm -hmm. um, I think the issues you bring up are, are very real issues. Um, but just, I don't know if it simplifies it, if anyone else has any idea how people can access things to keep warm, oh. you know, at night oh, yeah. well, that, without, you know. Yeah, no, that's, that feels I don't like know a what's different the question. most effective yeah, way to, to do it, me but the focus is, is almost entirely on sleeping bags and tents and just things that that address immediate survival needs yep. at night in cold weather. And yeah. I'm wondering if if the um, <coughs> the police department is open 24 hour. I know that there are always folks there. I also appreciate that that sort of brings with it, um, you know, some some other questions, You're comments, concerns. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, we've had difficulty in finding anybody who's. I mean, we haven't tried everything, but there are a lot of issues with finding anyone who's difficult to host either lockers or supplies. Right. Most mm -hmm. people will not, don't want it to use the space or there's issues with access or, you know, right. safety or trust or whatever. Mm -hmm. So this is, sure. you know. Yeah, I, yeah I'm sure, I'm, I, I, uh, I appreciate that question. It, I guess I, I see the, the issues as separate and distinct and now that I understand that that's the sort of where do we put things so that people can readily access them as opposed to necessarily store them I would. I think yeah, I see that. It's trying to solve the problem of people right. not having vital supplies, access yeah. to you necessary know, survival. Because they are repeatedly stolen, which they are, or repeatedly destroyed, or right. they get wet, and you mm -hmm. can't run right. to the laundromat at one in the morning right. with no money or whatever. So, right. Any further comments about the lockers? No. Okay. If you had, uh, what did yes. we want? Yeah. Um, so the bathrooms. This to this to me is is almost a, a bit of a no brainer. Um, I know that having publicly accessible bathrooms 24 hours a day carries with it attendant issues <laughs> that humans bring wherever humans are. Um, but, you know, I certainly don't imbibe the way I could once upon a time in my life. However, uh, you know, as a, as a late 20-something who was in Montpelier for a lot of that time, uh, there were times where it would have been really helpful to have access to a restroom in downtown, and not if I've been out drinking, you know, but even if I'm getting getting out of a movie late and I'm walking home. And um, and, and that, to me, is sort of like a, a critical piece to all of this, is like having facilities that are accessible when people leave bars so that they don't urinate on public streets or alleys, which is an ongoing concern in a few places here. Um, but I think it also affords people dignity. And um, I think government yeah, I is important to recognize that, you know, things that a lot of us take for granted, like a restroom facility that we have access to is, it's, it's about fundamental human dignity to me and the fact that it would only cost $3,000 for the year, if I'm reading this right, to for this city to have a bathroom that is accessible at all <coughs> times is, is worth the assumption of any potential risk that could come with it. So I, I think that's a, and $3,000 for a year, I, I mean, does not strike me, it's an investment, but it, it doesn't seem an insurmountable investment. Any other comments about 
the bathroom. Glenn. Um, I think it's a good idea, too. I'm curious, uh, you were talking about putting them in smart places, and I was curious whether there, there's been conversation about specific locations for them yet in the task force. I've missed the last couple of meetings, I'm sorry. Partly we need to look at um, where people will, will most likely be concentrated if they are sleeping outside, and we are still seeking to clarify property ownership and safety issues and stuff like that. Yeah, and I, I mean, I can imagine that, you know, city staff can, yeah, I mean, there's just some good thinking can go into that. I, I, it's preliminary at this point. You know, what what make, I mean, there are obviously a multitude of reason, of considerations. Um, I just want to also point out that this was something that you had on the FY20 budget this, this fiscal year. And so, again, with, um, you know, thinking around, you know, if you have a specific place in mind, I guess I, I would want to separate, it's, as you propose, I would want to separate um, this $3,000 out from our budget discussion. Um, it's not really uh, something, well, I guess it's something that we could include, again, for the next fiscal year, which is an ongoing cost. Yeah, yeah it is an on, ongoing thing, but um, again, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's some money, it's not um, a terrible lot, but, um, but I, I would feel uh, uh, much more comfortable discussing this if there was like a, it, you know, it's, they we're going to put one here and there, and uh, and so we can we can point at it rather than talking about it generally. And then uh, you know if we were going to start it in the middle of a fiscal year uh, anyway, then that's something that seems like perhaps is fluid and we can discuss any time potentially. I, 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 yeah, and I'm just in danger of thinking out loud. Um, which is never advised, but um, I mean, you know, there's the problem with the trash at the pocket park along the bike path. So maybe if you know there was a trash can and a porta potty there, you know, you know, the, the, there's basically um, or or down by another way or something like that. I mean, those are just two locations yeah, that just sure. jump out at me. Mm -hmm. uh, um, I, I before I get to you, Jack, I just want to. Um, note that the, there is some I, I don't love uh, making decisions about money outside of the budget process uh, I just want to make a note about that even though I, I just said oh yeah come back and ask another time but my hope is that that's not normal um, I'm just going to say that yeah go ahead. I, I think the idea of uh, <coughs> uh, sanitary facilities for people who need them is very important I think as I look forward into the long term, if we're really going to uh, provide facilities for uh, anyone in the public, uh, unhoused people or anyone else, um, I, I anticipate that some more substantial structure in those plastic porta johns are probably going to be where we should be moving. And so that's going to be more money, and they probably will need. Will need upkeep and such, but uh, as I say, that's probably a longer uh, term consideration that I just want to throw into uh, into your thinking. Uh, to that point as well, I know the business community would probably really appreciate um, porta potties generally downtown. Um, yeah. and, and, and let me just, I mean, just say, it's like addressing the, pro the, the needs of this population is going to help everybody's quality of life. Yeah. Unmet needs tend to express themselves in not always the best way. Yeah. So. Great. Did you have, want to continue? Um, same topic or the next one? Uh, ne I think the next one. Sure. Next section. Uh, where did my notes go? Seems like they disappeared. Okay, two seconds. Um, the next one was the, uh, that was the sort of general one was the no, shelter. Shelter, extensions. shelter extensions okay um, I love that we are talking about extending shelter season what I would love even more <laughs> if we could talk about extending shelter season because we're working on transitioning folks into permanent stable secure housing and I wonder and I say this knowing that I won't be here any longer after tonight to 
um, answer this question or provide any context or insight other than as a uh, citizen. But um, to me, this really sort of seems like a really unique opportunity given the changes that are coming on a state level to how counties are addressing housing related issues um, to maybe step back for a second and think about the money that we are going to expend to operate a shelter, which we have, I mean, that's this, we, the city funded it opening early, and I think we agreed to even keep those funds in there so that it could stay open later. But um, that's only a short term solution to a much more complex, long term chronic issue. And I feel strongly that <coughs> given the decentralization that the state has agreed to, because it's, it's not really working the way that the state intended it in terms of housing vouchers and making sure that um, we are getting folks into safe, secure housing, particularly in winter months. Um, I wonder if, so the housing trust fund is to get people into homes, although I know that it has historically been focused on first time home ownership, I, I submit to everyone here that there are a large number of folks myself being one of them and many other you know, millennials and folks younger than I am and older than I am, I think all over the spectrum, who um, home ownership, while certainly an exciting prospect, is not a pragmatic reality. And um, I love that Montpelier is, is also worrying about, you know, how are we going to make this a place that is attractive for families to, you know, to buy property here. But let's, I mean, we are the state capital. And I think that how we, how we react in situations where we see our friends, family, neighbors struggling, I think can give us a, a real unique opportunity to use this housing trust fund, which has done amazing work over the years to increase first time home ownership, but, but to potentially open some of that up to folks who who need assistance to move into some sort of supported housing arrangement. And so I would I would certainly, you know, if the question is allocating money for a shelter or not, I would say yes. But I want the question to go further, which is not just allocating for the temporary fix to a permanent and long-term problem, but rather to really start focusing that shift on, okay, you know, we're just focusing on the immediate needs and being able to step back a little bit and focus more on the long-term needs um, because I, I think that the resources exist. It's just really a question of <coughs> connecting all of that and making sure that you know we know what the available housing stock looks like. We know you know what sort of living arrangements are uh, available. And if you know if, if state money is not being matched, which my understanding is that is the case, that vouchers aren't able are being fully utilized because there's no community matching funds available. I'm curious to hear from the council. You know, if those monies exist, we have already allocated money towards housing. You know, it's the housing trust fund. It doesn't say first time home buyer trust fund. Um, what it would sort of look like to expand that to also help renters. Jack. I think it's important to point out that the great majority of the money that's been appropriated to the housing trust fund has, in fact, gone to creation of, uh, of rental housing. And there's a significant share of <coughs> we've the projects we've put, put it into include the uh, French Block, the Taylor Street project, 58 Barry Street, um, other uh, rental housing. We need more. I, I always say we need housing of all uh, types of tenure and all price levels. <coughs> and it's uh, one of the things that's enabled us to bring in outside funds for uh, for some of the big projects we've done has been that the city of Montpelier has committed some of the, our own taxpayers money to that uh, to those projects and I I'm glad that we're looking like we're going to keep the uh, trust fund at the same level uh, that we had last year and I hope we'll continue to be able to do not just home ownership but also uh, rental housing creation. But I, can I, may I just? I, um, yeah, and I then just, uh, I, we should probably keep going, but yeah. Creating rental housing is huge. I think, you know, I've, 
I've had that sort of scary, like I have 30 days left on my lease where I'm living and I know I need to move. I don't know where I'm going to move. Like, but that, you know, uh, building housing is one thing, but actually making sure that people are able to move in and continue to afford to pay for it is, uh, I think, sometimes even a, a more significant barrier. And, and whether that's because um, you know, it's a living arrangement that might not work for everyone, you know, whether it's that um, some folks might need uh, someone else to be present on occasion to help facilitate things, whatever it might be, you know, building housing is one thing, but making sure that people can actually access that housing, particularly folks who, um, you know, historically have been, have been experiencing chronic um, homelessness and, and other uh, related issues, it just strikes me that um, while building housing is one thing, making sure that we can actually house people in it in our communities is, is the second part of that question. And I don't know that, um, you know, that, that just building the housing is going to be enough to get people in there and able to pay their rent and, you know, sort of get them stabilized to a place where at least a housing need is met. Um, so I've, oh, just, go ahead, there is a short paragraph in the Housing Trust Fund's report talking about trying to meet that gap uh, for the homeless. And so it's just a little brief thing, but I think their attention is there also, that's all. So I, let me, I mean, I, I just attended, Beth Pierce just convened a, a housing summit up at the college, and I mean, she's looking at the economics of this statewide, $53 million maybe for 1,000 new units at $200,000 a unit. Um, you know, and I was talking to Polly Nickel on how, you know, about that's kind of what it costs. And I mean, I'm thinking, well, can't you talk to some, you know, good yes tomorrow builder t folks, you know, you know, can, can we, could we just put up some structures out by the stump dump or something, you know, can we just get people out of the cold now? I mean, we're doing a lot of thinking, which, you know, and let me just say about the shelters where you started is, I mean, the churches have, are, are doing tremendous work on behalf of the greater good. And um, they're feeling some, I mean, I, I, we definitely get indications that they're, 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 feeling, they're feeling the pressure of some of this. And, and not necessarily gonna, I mean, th there's no promise they're gonna continue doing what they're doing. You know, so we're talking about this $10,000 just to extend on either side of the season. Um, you know, so we're very grateful for what they're doing in between. <coughs> and yes, we're looking at the longer picture. This is a huge topic, you know, and the supportive service, the lack of meeting the needs for the, the, the housing vouchers. A lot of what we're trying to do is just, yeah, look at that whole system. It is a big, big question, and we've got all work together. So um, just looking at the time here, um, uh, this is valuable conversation, um, important topics. Um, I actually, you know, because I don't think we're going to be able to get to our whole agenda tonight as posted. Um, I think we're going to have to jettison a, a couple of things, uh, unfortunately. So one thought, uh, because I, I think there are two things that we can't jettison, right? One is uh, the conversation about the rec building, and the other is a conversation about the budget. Uh, and I, so I want to save some time for both of those things. Now, to be fair, we're not done with this conversation. Um, would How would you feel about um, pausing here, coming back next time to um, potentially uh, continue this conversation? Sorry, we're, we're not coming back. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you for your kind consideration. Yeah. I'd be happy to come back. Okay, that, that would be wonderful because I... Mean, I this is a budget request, so it's appropriate <laughs> to discuss as part of our budget conversations. It, it, yes, and it's... Uh, we don't have to have it all now, right? Yes, okay. So thank you. To be continued, if, if that's okay with the council. Um, did you have a just, comment, Connor? Uh, just a small thing to think about before next time. I think I'd have trouble green lighting a position with the uh, sort of the uh, street outreach positions that pay like $11.25 okay, cents an hour there. I think the math right. we, just, we just kind of threw it in at that rate because it would be an introductory program and longer term you might want to look at something else. but. Um, part of it is we're trying to be cost effective. We're trying to get no, it sure, to sure. happen. I'm, yeah, you I'm know. just wondering if one position that's uh, paid better might get a better caliber of candidates and I, also be a little more consistent. That's another conversation, you know, actually. Some of the other things we're doing, so. Yeah. Okay. Just, just a thought. 
um, and Lauren, go ahead. Just, just another thing, um, if you're kind of looking at fleshing some of this out a little more, and again, like thank you for all this great work, it's so appreciated. Um, just the, the general fund, I mean, I like the idea of having a responsiveness fund. Are there, are there models that other <coughs> cities or examples, and maybe just a little more tangible of, you know, these are the kinds of things that it would be available to do, just to put some more kind of clarity around what Right. Yeah. How I mean, would that work, and what kinds of things would it fund, and, and if there's kind of examples that we could look at, that would be great. Right. So I have um, a friend who runs a sojourner house down in Roxbury, Massachusetts, and she has a business model where she keeps families together. She's able to build, pull funds down from different budgets. We're saving the prisons money. We're saving the schools money. We're saving the hospitals money. So I, I mean, this is a work in progress, but there are a lot of examples out of there. There are things that work. Um, and, you know, and we're, I mean, we're running pretty fast trying to learn and, you know, find solutions. Um, so this is a little bit of a work in progress, frankly, but there is a lot out there. There's a lot of homework we're, we're, we're doing, we're trying to do a lot of research. Of, yeah, there's, there are models out there. There's a lot of smart people getting together and we're, and there's a lot of like, okay, you're having this, there are five different groups are having the same conversation. Let's all get together. So. So. Okay. Well, thank you so much, and we'll thank we'll you. see you again. Okay. okay. Thanks. Thank Sounds good. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So, just as a matter of um, uh, considering the agenda, uh, we had scheduled a public hearing for the um, interim river hazard map amendment, some zoning, um, uh, and I, I'm guessing, is there anyone here for that? No. Okay. Um, so, I mean, one hypothesis is that we could just open it and close it, but I, I think that there's probably more conversation that w we need to have around that. Um, nonetheless, I'm going to open the public hearing. Now I'm going to close the public Someone's hearing. Move to set another one. For yes. Would anyone like to reschedule or not reschedule, but to move in another hearing for that? I move we schedule the next public hearing for our next meeting on January is it the eighth? Yes. I'll second. Further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Um, and just as a um, looking forward, um, Donna, I know you had brought forth the, okay. the dog. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> January 8th is going to be really crowded. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's, that's fine. That's great. And before we move <coughs> What's forward, that? I, I have a communication from a constituent who wanted to make public comment about the uh, homelessness issue, he's not able to be here, and he said that John Odom, the clerk, was going to read his comments. <laughs> I just, uh, it's Morgan, and I had in informed Ann, and I actually, when she started continuing it, I emailed him back saying, you know, good news, you can still have a chance, because he wanted to be here to, to deliver it in person. If he'd rather not, I'm, I'm still happy to read it. I, I thought I was delivering good news. Okay. <laughs> well, I think it's better to give him that opportunity. Okay. 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 All right, but thank you. Um, okay, so on to uh, the rec center uh, updates and decision. Uh, so welcome. My name is John Dale. I'm uh, our, the uh, project architect with Breadloaf Corporation that did the study for the uh, rec center renovation. And John Johnston, uh, mechanical electrical fire protection for Breadloaf. <coughs> So just to, um, we're just going to, uh, Cameron put together, and we helped a little bit with put together this PowerPoint presentation just to go back to what we talked about the last time, is that the, very quickly, is that this is the existing rec center. It's on Barry Street. It was built originally as an armory. Uh, that looks much better with the lights off. Um, and uh, the north is up on the page, and uh, Barry Street is there on the right, and you can see the proposed re uh, restoration of the parking uh, pavement around the building, which is limited. Uh, and this is the proposed renovations of the basement, which would be to uh, put in, install an elevator at the uh, sort of the lower, over in the, to the, on the right side with an entrance from the outside that would allow you uh, handicap access to the basement, to the first floor and to the second floor. Uh, the uh, the two uh, 
changing rooms and shower bathrooms would be built, one on the north side, northeast corner, and one on the southeast corner for men and women. On the first floor, there would be a family slash non-gender full bathroom available. Uh, and then renovating this, uh, what is a you know, series of storage rooms and shooting gallery in the main part of the, uh, of the basement underneath the basketball floor. We are proposing four uh, different fitness areas that could be a weight room, a cardiovascular room, uh, you know, some spinning classes, dance classes, et cetera, tai chi and so forth. And then to the left is the, uh, underneath the uh, stage, the original stage is the loading dock and storage area, introducing new e egress and so forth. Uh, and so this would, all of these renovations would be basically, the baseline renovations we're discussing is to gut the building down to the studs or the masonry, uh, re replace portion, about two, a third or half of the slab in the basement, all new electrical systems, all new electric service, uh, all new plumbing and mechanical systems on all three floors, uh, all new lighting, et cetera. And, uh, and then the appropriate athletic flooring in each space. This is the first floor, the main floor, just um, uh, which is about five feet above the street level. So the gymnasium is the main space in the middle. We, that would be involved replacing all the lighting in there uh, and replacing the, the gymnasium floor with a sprung wood, new wood floor. Uh, and then introducing classrooms at the front of the building and office space so, uh, with an observation for the, to control the entrance. The stage would be used for equipment storage for that would be used directly in the gymnasium. And then the top floor is just on the east side of the building would be office space for the rec department and a conference room and offices and so forth. Um, this is a diag when we met the last time we presented two options. One was sort of a base cost. The next was an upgraded cost, which improved the efficiency of the HVAC equipment, which would be mounted on the roof. Uh, improvements to some of the finishes and so forth. Um, uh, and one of the options, and then there was a request from the council to also look in more energy efficient, uh, uh, how close we could get to essentially a microgrid or a net zero um, approach to the building. This diagram is, it's a little hard to see, is showing our proposal that we'll go into more detail on of mounting uh, the maximum amount of uh, photovoltaic panels on the roof. And we're basically confining them to the main roof of the gymnasium. The front roof would be used for mechanical equipment, correct? Right. Can I ask a question about that? Sure. Uh, which way is uh, solar south? Solar south is down. Okay. So, mm. Well, due is south it? is down. Wait, where the dot dots are? Mm. Yeah. North is up, due up. Okay. So it's you know it'd be yeah, sad. I, I'm not confident to that either. I think it's I I would have I would have guessed from thinking about where Barry Street is that north is the top right corner, and south is the bottom left corner. Uh, it's yes. Skewed. As a resident of Barry Street, I I'll agree it's not Barry Street doesn't. Yeah, it doesn't run uh, quite as east west as you would think. This could be I could. Uh, Neglect, forgotten. That's exactly okay. Already. Well, I just did a note. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> so this is a spreadsheet of the three <laughs> options. So the one on the left is the base option, which, as I said, included gutting it down to the uh, to the studs and rebuild, you know, redoing all the finishes. Uh, new, as I say, we said all new systems, installing a new elevator that would be allow you access to all levels. Uh, the east wing with the insulation of the, where the offices and classroom spaces is insulating the perimeter walls, adding interior storm windows to the existing windows and re refurbishing the windows, installing new windows in the gymnasium. There are presently no windows in the gymnasium that have been blocked up. New women's and men's locker rooms and shower rooms in the non-gender bathroom and four new exercise rooms in the basement. Um, the, me the middle option, cost option of 4.7 million and again, uh, these cost estimates also include our estimates for the, all the owner's costs in terms of permitting, architectural engineering fees, uh, uh, hazardous materials, uh, abatement, et cetera. Uh, is to install more energy efficient rooftop units, replace the full basement slab, uh, and add a, can add a canopy entrance to the, to the main entrance into the elevator entrance. 
so uh, allowance for fitness and weight room equipment for the for the exercise rooms, uh, upgrading the finishes in the bathrooms and showers, improving even more so the electrical and lighting systems in terms of efficiency, emergency generator for the building, and replacing the roofing on the east end of the building. And then in response to the uh, request at the last meeting is uh, upgrades that would totally come up to a total of 5.2 million estimated which would include everything under option two plus um, upgraded HVAC system to be fossil free, air source heat pumps, insulate the gym walls to re improve the energy efficiency of the building, and the inst installation of the solar array. And John Johnston will go into more detail on this. Uh, did, you did you send us this diagram? I don't remember seeing it. They, we created, they had a, a delay in the information, so we created this a little later. We will send this to you when, um, We'll update this. Um, okay. So we'll send this to you as well. I'm sorry, it was just no, one of those things I got pulled together. It's very helpful. I tried to make the differences, in the, but that's helpful. <coughs> so, <coughs> well, I haven't talked in a while. So the, uh, <coughs> the, the, the additional energy efficiency or heading towards a net zero, uh, what, we, what we looked at was really going to a complete air source heat pump system. And that's where it dictates some of the other systems as you, as you filtrate down. Um, what we're seeing now, um, well, I'll just go down in order. The solar array would, would cover about 40 to 60 percent of the building, and these are big, rough estimates um, at this point because it, it was, you know, it was a planning study of, of order of magnitudes. Um, to give you an idea, it, it would produce what we're looking at was 57,000 kWh a year. Your lighting in the building, assuming it's 10 hours a day maybe six days a week, and, and again, we'd have to get into it with, with the staff more on what it would be. It, the lighting might be 30,000 kWh, so to give you some order of magnitude. It's not gonna cover the whole building, but it's gonna cover your lighting and a lot of your miscellaneous loads when we got into the full heating with all electric air source heat pumps or the full air conditioning, if you chose full air conditioning for the gymnasium, say. Um, it's, it's not gonna cover you on those peaks. Um, that being said, what, what we're really seeing is uh, the new air source heat pump systems can, can operate down to minus 22 degrees. So we have like four hours a year in Vermont that we're going to be below the, uh, below minus 20 on average. So you might get it eight hours. So the key with that is going to really, as much as we can do for the envelope. So one of the things was taking the gymnasium, which we weren't really re-insulating in those first two price range and saying we're going we're gonna to insulate the walls there and get this resilient envelope so we don't have any issues. Um, but we're actually, we're right in the cusp because now that we can go to minus 22 and really they operate to minus 30, we're getting to the point where we don't need to hardly worry about that envelope as much as we did five years ago. Currently, most systems install go to minus 13 <coughs> degrees. Um, that being difference, <coughs> we'd have a myriad of zones within the building, so at each office and each space would have a thermostat, so we're not gonna see it's after hours. <laughs> <laughs> Hurry up, John. So, um, so those were the, the basic things. And when we looked at, is there another page on this or not? Yes. When we, you know, we looked at the district heat. It's a quarter mile. It's you know roughly a quarter mile away. Our experience on campuses. You know, we can see a hundred to four hundred dollars a linear foot. I don't know how many utilities are in the in the. Berry Street that we'd have to work around. So, uh, unless you really, you know, got a few more users up there to put on this system, I, I we truly believe it'd be uh, would it be cost effective, uh, and you'd be better off spending your money on a solar array or some other things that are doing doing more work for you. Next, um, biodiesel biodiesel generators. <clears throat> we don't see too much in the HVAC system use of bio biofuels right now, mostly in transportation is where we see it. If we were to say we can't get enough array on the roof, which we know, could would you want to put a gen couple generators in or a generator to run the building and then you have a microgrid? Y yes, you could do that. I'm not sure how um, cost effective would be and, and as far as, you know, you're in a neighborhood there, so it might be a little tough to have generators running, you know, uh, 20, 20 hours a day or something. Um, but 
something that we could definitely be analyzed uh, with the air source heat pump in there, so prevalent of what we're doing in almost every project these days. It, 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 you know, what we've seen for the town of Hartford, their town office, and Middlebury's town office, while they didn't have enough roof area because of their downtown nature and historic things, issues, we ended up giving them a net zero building and they, point, they, they built an array somewhere else and pointed at that meter. And so it's a net zero, zero ready building. It's not net zero on site, but it, it, is, a, it is an opportunity to, to you know, say we have a net zero rec center with the array somewhere else off site. Sorry, can I jump in on that too? It, uh, it's probably worth noting that we have a one megawatt array already, which is 500 kilowatts yeah. over the cap. Exactly. Uh, and so I don't know what, how that works necessarily with if we can do it behind the meter. Yeah. Uh, mm. that, yeah. Yeah. Uh, that, to be continued. That, that's to be continued because yeah. sooner or later they're going to have to uncap that. Yeah. So yeah. They, yeah. They, or we have to push to have that uncapped because um, a lot of towns are running into that. <clears throat> There, what's next, John? That's, uh, next goes into the um, amortization and the bond. Oh, yeah. Is there any right. questions on the approach? And the so just to go back to the, um, the heat pumps and the mm -hmm. potential for insulation, am I understanding correctly that, that uh, we may not need to insulate the gymnasium because the heat pumps are good enough that they can heat the building without? Yes. It would take some more analysis whether you want to do that because the envelope is so important and especially with some of the other discussions that were had concerning this being a shelter type building you know where you know if there is a catastrophe we might not have power and you know that resilient envelope does a lot. It, it's a it was, it's an $80,000 item to be discussed and, and probably not only discussed, but also done a life cycle analysis on. And the other thing is we basically assumed a relatively mo uh, a modified insulation on the exterior, not up to necessarily code because of the concerns about damaging the masonry. I think we covered that the last time, which is if you over insulate the exterior walls that you can end up damaging the brick and the brick deteriorates prematurely. But again, a lot of that would be a, a it's detailed an analysis study we'd have to on that brick right wall and okay. how is that. So yeah. we, we've done in other buildings where if there's three whites of brick, it ventilates itself. So you can add the insulation and not have any fear of damaging the wall. Just yeah. The other question that I had, you're, you're get moving to amortization, but is there an analysis of uh, operating cost uh, savings by uh, Going to the PV for a large percentage of the of the electricity. There has not that has not been done yet. That's the next level of okay. which I think we'll get to in a little bit. That's the next level of study. Mm -hmm. um, typically, because to flush all these out it needs to be fully modeled. Mm -hmm. in order to, you know, okay, and thanks. Start down the design, the true design process. So just to piggyback on that question so that's not something that you could have uh, prior to us making a decision about which direction we want to go the reason I say that is because knowing the ongoing operating costs of each of these choices will I mean if it were attainable yeah. to have that information would I think help inform our decision so typically, that's what we work through through the, the, the start of the design process is the first the, uh, true schematic and design development process. We would work through all those, actually all these options that we're presenting today and say which ones are the most cost effective on, on life cycle and whatnot. Um, it, it's, a, it's the planning study aspect versus starting down the road yeah. of design because yeah. uh, it does need to be modeled uh, to get we can we can give you ideas, but if you want if we want to be comfortable, and that's one of the hardest things of, of any type of this all this analysis is what are the hours of operation, you know, and then we can model it. And it's the insulation and the and the, the lighting and the air source heat pumps. That's all. Once you once you build the model, it's easy to flush through and analyze. Yeah. Any other 
just wanted, we gave this to you guys in your packet. This was a um, base assumption um, of our scheduled payout for the bond if we went for an estimated $5 million bond that Todd provided us. So we just wanted to include that for context within this discussion to what this would look like over time for us. Are there any questions on this that we can get answered for you? Um, I would love to see this uh, plotted against our uh, debt policy. Does that make sense? Well, and while you're doing that, Bill, we, we talked ahead about having it integrated with the CIP because I was concerned about the bond payment and... Yeah, we can talk about that. That's easy. As I look at this, um, I'm confused about uh, that, that first that page of uh, that was five of five in the handout we got of all all the numbers. Um, we have term thirty one years, amortization period thirty years, and average life fifteen point eight four years. And what is that? What's being measured by that life? Um, like, are we, does this mean that we're paying for thirty years for something that's only going to last for fifteen years? Right. I mean, oh, the oh, the, when we looked at this in terms of the, I don't know anything about the finances. Yeah. So no, no. The the so, I can I can give this a high level answer. This is probably more of a Todd answer. But the the bond bank floats several different bonds, and then we see the the blended version of all of them. So what they're saying is the average maturity life of the bonds in this mix would be about 15 years, but it's not the life of the asset. The building would certainly be inclined to. So we would be purchasing, we would be paying this off over 30 years for a building we assume would last much longer than 30 years. I would hope so, yeah. Thanks. Right. And the intent of the study was, or the guide we used was that this was a 50 to 100 year building. You know, that these were improvements that would be indefinite. You know, yeah. Good. Yeah. You can see the source of my confusion there. Yes. <laughs> I asked um, Brett Loeb to sort of um, come up with an estimation about what this process would really look like for us. There, yep. Um, so I asked Brett Loeb to come up with some base understanding of how long it would take them to get them to the next step to get us ready if you guys wanted to move forward with any sort of bond scheduling. Um, and because we wanted to remind you that this the work that they've done so far is a feasibility study. This is not a fully modeled building. Um, these are their recommended renovations. So these estimates are what Bredlow believes they can reach, you know, within that um, amount. Um, but it is not a fully modeled building. So um, there's a couple different things that we have to take into account when we decide to move this forward to March or November. Um, so. I'd, I'd like them to talk a little bit about that, and then we can talk about our next steps. So assuming you needed more information by the end of January um, for March vote, is that correct? Is that the timing? Is that um, some of the things that we think would be, uh, that we'd be most concerned about is is eliminating some of the risk factors in the, that are in, that we've tried to incorporate into the estimate, but just to make sure that they've been covered in terms of the estimated cost. So one would be the uh, uh, structural assessment of the roof in the, in the foundations. There is, some, there is one notable crack in the building that then transmits into the slab, which is, one, you know, we tried to cover um, repairing the slab and dealing with it in that area. And theoretically, the crack has been there for an indefinite period of time, and it's not necessarily an, uh, an, you know, an, it's an, a risk that's increasing. But is we'd really want to look at the structural, the, it would be wise or prudent to have a structural engineer go through 
and just review the existing structure and make sure that it is sound, and particularly as there's been discussion of using this as an informal shelter and so forth. And also add, with the added load of the, uh, uh, the P PV panels on the roof, which is not huge, but there's, is, it's starting to add up. You've added insulation in the last few years, which adds load to the roof, and now you're adding the PV panels, the load from the snow load, because of the, it's not melting like it did 30 years ago. Uh, and also is to confirm, uh, we made a wild, uh, not wild, but a fairly conservative estimate of what, how much, what the uh, hazardous material extent might be and the, what it might be to abate that. What if we're wildly optimistic about how much we, you know, that there's much more than what we're estimating is to have, you know, it's the habit hazardous uh, material um, expert go through and do an assessment of the building and what those costs might be. Uh, there's more fully confirm the energy efficiency options that are being discussed. Start, which is, would be doing the beginning of the modeling or do the, do the model so we can start running some analysis right. on, on that. Uh, and then um, it's just essentially doing our coordination of all those efforts of those consultants. So essentially we're pretty confident about the, what we proposed architecturally and the finishes and so forth that these are appropriate and we have the right cost for them, but it's, the other, it's get, sort of getting initial consultation in from consultants on the on the building and make sure that that's been incorporated into into the study and into your sense of the cost so those are something that we think that could that it would be feasible to do get that uh, some real information back on that by the end of January and that could cost up to say one percent of the construction cost which would be uh, thirty to forty thousand dollars some of that's including your cost because you would be hiring the hazardous material consultant in but we would coordinate with that if you wanted to get even more detailed into it if this was moving back to a, a next vote you know we could we could extend this out and become even more definitive in, over a couple of months yeah, about the cost what the estimated cost would be for the project and, and if it was November vote I, I will say the last line the 15 20 percent of CDs construction documents would be more apropos for November you know, we're not going to get you know, three weeks, 20% CDs right. without having construction, construction documents. documents. Yeah, big documents. And I, you know, I think this is one of the things that comes up is for the council's benefit, I think often when we have bond projects because people will say, you know, you don't have all these specific projects, but, you know, before you invest what it costs to get there, you, you want to be sure that there's support for the project. So, you know, we do often go forward with, with estimates and say, you know, maybe go a little high to, you know, to get bonding authority up to a certain amount. But, you know, the flip side is, you know, I don't know, what what's it going to cost to get the construction documents, $100,000, something like that? I mean, realistically, with engineers and everything else. So right. do we put that money out and then find out that the voters don't approve the project? So, you know, I think those are important. <coughs> and when, when we, I just want to point out, we also, when we did those budgets that we showed on the, that Cameron showed on the spreadsheet, each of those budgets includes a contingency factor for the owner that's t at 10%. That's, uh, it's, it's, at this, at this, it's, point, this is yes. a, pro yeah, it might, for us. right, going into bidding, that might be considered overly conservative, but at this point, it seems pretty, for a building that's a standing building that doesn't have a lot of site issues and so forth, this seems like a reasonable contingency at this point. So that would cover things like, say, oh, that might cover, hopefully it would cover things like there's more hazardous materials. The roof needs strengthening, things like that. So, and, and you know, we do have in-house estimating. We're design build, we're construction right. company, we're an architectural firm, so our numbers are, you know, we stand and live by our numbers. So. Right. Oh yeah, no, I'm not. I'm not questioning no, you. I, I was. This is more for just people yeah. understanding the process that you know, it's it's we, we want as much precision as we can get, but then we have to decide how much of that we want to pay for before we take it to a vote. And, and I think, you know, then we hear pushback during the public, you know, while you don't actually know. And I was like, you're right, we don't know because yep. we won't. You know, we, we, we're building a $17 million plant, white wastewater plant that we, we think we know. And, and so far it's coming in on budget, but, you know, you don't know until you're doing it. So. Yes. Uh, one thing that I think would be helpful, at least, and I, I know that I'm not going to be here any longer, but I, I think would be helpful to conceptualize uh, what the addition of this potential project 
um, to the city would mean in terms of bonding and um, money in versus money out, it would be helpful to have the city put together something about sort of where, um, you know, we're bonding. We bonded for the water resource recovery um, facility. We bonded for the parking garage. And, you know, we're, we're, we may ask to bond for this. I think it would be helpful for folks to sort of conceptualize a lot easier, like a comparison, like here's where the city is at, you know, in terms of this has been authorized for bonding. And, you know, we anticipate these things and, and sort of that translates to this liability for the city would be a, a helpful thing, I think, for, for residents to sort of look at to be able to make an informed decision about, you know, what they think is best. Um, so not this is it this is our last slide so um, with all of that being said you know there's a couple choices on the table you can move forward with bonding with our estimates you could want to spend that was abrupt more <laughs> right <laughs> yeah um, uh, you know group, uh, spending more to get them to get us closer to those construction construction documents or deciding even which vote to aim for so there's a lot of choices. Um, we also, as a um, Arnie and Jana and Alec and I have worked together as you know the community services department to sort of propose a date to have folks um, have a special meeting if you want one to um, have people review the rec center options and then you know be invited to the to view the rec center in its current state. So we which we'd be both you know really yeah. helping. Um, and Bob, I know you have a question. Yeah, I apologize if I missed. Um, <coughs> will the building have a complete fire alarm system and sprinkler system? Yes. yes. They'll both be on. Yeah, yeah okay. I, I must have missed that. Yeah, thank you. Okay. <laughs> I, we didn't mention that. But, uh, that oh, was in our first It's in the budget. Okay, thank you. Uh, Jack. I think this is a question that uh, Bill may know the answer to off the top of his head. There is a question uh, in the. Uh, uh, estimated budgets, there's a question of whether building permit fees were payable or exempt. My, I thought I remembered that when we were doing the water resource recovery facility that we did have to pay permit fees. Yes, we, that, we, right? we would include those fees in, in the budget. And the reason for that is that um, we, we also had factored that in with the, the parking garage, even though we haven't done it yet. But the reason for that is we have to do that work now just like anyone else would, and so it comes from the bonded funds into our present. It's sort of a, it's an appropriate payment if it were paid to the state. If it was a per state permit, we have to pay for all of those. So it's it's helping offset the cost that the current day taxpayers. So that, so that eliminates one possible, possible safety. <laughs> no, no, I was going to say it eliminates one eliminates one question mark in the. Yes, we just know correct. How yes. to fill that in. Yeah. So, uh, in terms of thinking about whether we're going for March or whether we're going for November uh, with this, if we want to go for it at all, um, knowing that potentially construction documents are those that, that cost something, and so we wouldn't have those regardless, right? Unless you for, chose to. If, you if we decide to pay for them right. sort of separately outside of the scope of this, right? Um, us, barring that, uh, what might be the differences in information that we would have if we went with March versus if we went with November? It's really just the specificity, the guaranteedness of the, that's a new one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Did it guarantee something? <laughs> that's, a, uh, that's a 940 <laughs> word. <laughs> uh, just the accuracy of what you're voting on. In a, you know, it's, and it's, it's a matter of percentage, you know. And in, in a lot of it is just what Bill's saying is that the, you know, we've been behind the questions from the public when you, you're doing it with a, a feasibility study versus, you know, a 50% or 80 We've done it at all different levels. And, you know, it's the questions, it's, it, you know, it's how you can answer the questions with how much confidence. Jack. Sorry to. You kind of be dominating the discussion. I think the for me the biggest 
piece of information that we might have in November that we don't have now is the fate of the uh, parking garage and what impact that might have on uh, our total uh, bond indebtedness. We don't know that it's going to be resolved by November, but uh, we might. But we can do a model with, you know, I think that the mayor said is to look at our, our debt policy and our, you know, and assuming that it's it's going to happen uh, and understanding that that's not necessarily being funded by general fund taxes. Uh, but we could certainly, that's easy enough to do, I, I say, for Todd and Kelly to do. <laughs> not gonna do it. It's easy enough for them to do. <laughs> it is, though. I know how to do it, too. It's not um, Bill, I'm, forgive me for not knowing the answer to this question, but when do we need to decide? So we have to hold a public hearing on a bond. You have to, you know, we have to pass our, um, and so one thing we can do is to pass the necessity resolution. You, know, you should do that in advance of, you know, because you, you can pass that and not actually pass the bond. <coughs> so that's just a formality that we have to do. Uh, we have to hold a public hearing uh, on the bond before the election. Normally we do that the day before our la the meeting before our last hearing on the 15th. But ultimately you can still decide to pull it. I mean, you could hold a public hearing on the bond. I mean, that might be one way to go is present this, see, you know, See what kind of feedback we get from the public, from the public, and float it out, and then you can you ultimately you you decide on the last day whether to put it on the ballot or not. Interesting. Okay. Other thoughts, Donna. I would hope this project gets a lot of attention, and I would rather get it out sooner and do a sort of a push towards March and see what happens. Uh, rather than to wait November is going to be such an intense oh, gosh, election right. cycle. I don't want this to get lost. <laughs> I really don't want yeah. That's a good point. I didn't think about that. Um, any other? Oh, Lauren. Um, yeah, I, I generally, I mean, it seems like, especially knowing that we would still have options, is preparing for March and moving forward and doing the things and seeing, holding public hearing, I think January 7th seems great. See what kind of... Um, engagement, reactions, um, knowing that there was the whole public survey on this topic, um, so we had a lot of information from the community at that point, um, but, you know, is this, does this become a really kind of contentious conversation in the community, or is this a really rah-rah, let's move forward, and then, and, and we can, uh, but give us the, the opportunity, you know, do whatever due diligence we need to be moving forward to um, pursue March if, if it seems like that, you know, becomes feasible and, like, it's going to be a good <laughs> process. Uh, are, what are people's leanings generally? Uh, would you, uh, who's, who's I'm sort of leaning towards going towards uh, March? Yeah, yeah. Oh. Oh. yeah. I would say no. Yeah. But, <laughs> but you still can. Okay. I, I, I will right say now. no, and I will only say no because um, I think there's a lot of, I know that the November election is going to be a big one, but I think that also means higher voter participation. And I think that there is right now an opportunity to have a really robust community conversation about the design and plan of the rec center. Um, and at least from my perspective, the parking garage um, illuminated a, a lot of uh, perceptions and beliefs and um, you know and, and frankly I also saw some room where you know there might be room for us to make some space as a city in terms <laughs> of how we engage with folks and um, to me I would I would I would really push to wait till November so that the community can be engaged in this process so that questions that you know come up about design or things like that can be uh, fully answered for community members for the council um, but also because I think we'll be in a little bit, we'll have a little bit more information about the parking garage and, and what that posture looks like. Um, and I, I think that there's a lot of value in, I think there's a lot of interest in this particular topic. I received lots of phone calls and lots of emails when this came up. And, um, <coughs> you know, it's wintertime. It's kind of awful to have to leave the house where it's snowing and cold. 
Um, and I want to make sure that everyone has an opportunity to come out and express their enthusiasm or I, I would express enthusiasm, but I appreciate that others might not. Um, and I just want to make sure that we have enough time and space to actually answer questions that are asked. And, and instead of sort of sticking to a self-imposed deadline of March, um, I, I guess I would just encourage folks to think about you know higher voter turnout and a more meaningful community conversation to to sort of address some of those planning. You know, what's this going to look like? Because with the parking garage, we were kind of making changes like as we were going and, and I think there was a that, at least for me that's not a process that like I function well in so I would I would encourage people to think about November Good. Um, that makes sense to me I don't think I'm <coughs> terribly worried one way or the other about March versus November um, I I would go along with either of those uh, schedules I wanted to throw in uh, since we're talking about what we think about all this uh, just the um, my preference for if we're going to uh, spend a lot of money renovating the rec center I think we should go for the the most efficient um, and uh, closest to energy neutral building we can and I'm I'm uh, I would push for that angle. I'd love to get more information on the operational costs and so on. Uh, and if if that could be forthcoming by November, then that would be an argument in my mind for pushing it out further. Wait, what would be? So if if we if we um, if we could get more information about the operational costs of the different options by pushing the bond vote to November versus March, then I would, then I think that's a strong argument in my mind for pushing it to November, so we have those numbers. Uh, Lauren? Um, I, I still think we could work towards March, but I very much agree with Ashley's sentiment of wanting to do a really robust, really proactive, engagement, outreach, and if we felt like it was being too rushed or there were unanswered questions, I mean, I guess at some point, not, not having been through this process of, you well, know, once, once it's on the once ballot, you, once then you you're put it on the ballot in. and the ballot's a printed. So we have till end I think of we January. can, I think actually you, we can say we're not going to have it, but it's still out there. You know, I don't know what happens if we don't, I, so I think no, you can withdraw the, the it from the ballot, when, but I don't know how that works practically for the clerk. Um, I'm not sure. I don't think you can. There are state deadlines. When it when the ballot is done, the ballot is done. I, and I what think date I, is that? Mm -hmm. um, that includes, you know, if a candidate were <laughs> right suddenly. I would also. Pass away, oh, hang on. Uh, Donna, go ahead, and then Ashley. Well, by March, would you not have better numbers for us if we decided to invest that money to do it? Yes. So there's a different due date of getting things printed, and your town meeting. And we can have as many public hearings as we want between Jan from now and the vote. And if the vote doesn't make it, then fine, we do more. Okay. But I just think we're more ahead to get out there quicker and do more now, and then we can do more later. This is a non-ending public information project. <laughs> uh, the only other thing that I would highlight about November versus March is, uh, you know, budget season is upon us and there are lots of hard decisions to make there also and it I I also I mean for me it's I don't think it's the best look to talk about sort of adding or cutting certain services you know over others and then you know on the other hand of that we're also asking voters to approve a bond vote I mean I guess um, I know that that's how life works, but it, it just, um, if, if I have learned anything in my time, it's that um, perception is really important when it comes to planning. And um, if, if the council is willing to sort of put in the extra time there, I, I think that the, the benefit could be 
significant in the in the longer term, you know, as we sort of figure out ways to navigate what it may mean to bond and, and have a new rec center, which I think most people said they want, you know, but the, but the biggest question has been a funding question. Um, and if we're already talking about a tax increase for the March um, budget, and, you know, then we're asking about bonding and, and other things, I, I fear that, um, that's an awful. That's an awful lot of asks that are that um, I think create a lot of cognitive dissonance that m may not sort of comport in a way that moves us all forward the way we would like to go. So one thought here is that regardless of whether we're going for, I mean, we we can um, you know pr proceed with the necessity. Uh, what, what is it called? Well, we can do so all the procedural stuff. We can do we can do that part. We can. Uh, have a public hearing uh, on the seventh, and then uh, t that so as I a. I think what. Sorry to interrupt, but just yeah. so we're clear about our mm -hmm. terminology, I think if we had, we, we would probably have to be a public forum or. Oh, a public okay, thank you. Meeting. Not a public hearing. Yeah. Okay. There's a pu the public hearing is a certain warning. Yep. And, fair enough. So so have a have a, a general informational meeting right. for the public, get their feedback, um, right. get, you know, sort of take the temperature, um, and then decide after that. Just how does that, do that? That way we have some time to digest this. I know having seen all of this information, I have lots of other put more in the weeds kind of questions, which I don't uh, need to take up time with right now. Uh, but I think it could be further conversation. I just had a question for to clarify my thinking on this. <coughs> Did you want us to present all of these options to? the general public, or do you want to move forward with one of these three options for us to really do a deeper dive into for presenting purposes? To mean in terms of what we would be presenting at, let's say, a, a public meeting? Yes. What's your thought, team? I mean, my, uh, well, yes, go ahead, Moin. I mean, to me, I, I could see possibly presenting a base project of what needs to be done to become ADA compliant and to just basic upgrades. To me, the what we're calling the eco-friendly are just part of what ev any building that Montpelier is investing in should be doing. So I don't want to, I don't like seeing that as add-ons. I think when we look at the future of energy and know that there's going to be carbon pricing and other things, even the modeling we do today, I think it does not accurately reflect the 30, 40, 50 year time horizon of what fossil fuels are going to cost and so on. So to me, Maybe there's a, an upgraded version that includes the um, option three, and there's a base project that people could look at. I mean, things that might be, you know, have yeah, been two, add ons two in option part two. Of three, right? Two. Right. Yeah. So, so, so you three, have two. So, so two, two options. options. Yeah. Yeah. There's yeah. there's like an upgraded option yeah. that you get all of these things that are right now option two and three, or a base project to be clear yeah. of what what we could get if we just wanted to become kind of compliant and basic. Um, upgrades is one proposal. Yep. Um, I, I like that. Can't believe I'm suggesting this. Um, but I just want to note that because we are over the one megawatt or <laughs> the 500 kilowatt limit right now, um, that if we were going to put solar on it, it would have to be um, delayed. Um, so I want, and, and Green Mountain Power has this 100% um, uh, renewable goal. So, the, the, optionally, that's something that, I don't know, I Could can't believe I'm suggest. That? What's that? Could you explain what you just said? Uh, both of the things, both of those items? <laughs> yeah. uh, are, are you going to sell it to Green Mountain Power? The, no. The, the cap, the whole thing. Uh, so, I might even just rescind this comment. And be like, no, let's just keep it in. It's fine. It's fine. No, it's good. Do you, do you, think, do you think so? I know there's momentum behind changing that for municipalities. The cap on okay. how, on solar it, statute would need to change. So yeah. well, yes, really there might be it. there might become an issue of what the city can and can't right. do. But I think there's a lot of interest from a lot of communities in changing that. So so but, to explain, um, uh, there's a rule in Vermont that no single uh, Consumer of electricity can offtake more than uh, 500 kilowatts of electricity, uh, and so major users end up getting um, they 
can't, you know, sometimes, uh, I mean, so one megawatt for us, twice the current limit, is approximately 50% of our total electric need. Um, so, you know, I mean, we would be limited to a quarter of what we would want to be able to, to offtake. Um, and that's, that's pretty problematic. Um, anyway, so we're at one megawatt right now. We got in before that cap went into place. So we're just prevented from doing anything further. Yeah. And, and just to your second point, there is, again, a statute. There is an effort underway um, supported by major utilities to increase the in-state renewable requirement to do 100% renewable electricity standard by 2030. That would, presumably, you would need to be raising all these caps to allow for more um, more solar and other renewable energy, so that is going to be an active conversation in this legislative session. Clearly, that won't get resolved until, you know, after potentially a, a, a vote on right. this, if it happened in March. So, but. But that might be a question that we can put out to people as well. Is that of value to them? Do you have something to add? Um, yeah. The only suggestion I might add, I am a very visual learner, so words are super helpful and I use them a lot, but <coughs> I love that budget spreadsheet that we have where we can like make our own additions and subtractions and see sort of what the financial impact is of adding or subtracting, you know, particular positions, proposals, things like that. Um, and I wonder if this is something where a, a similar sort of tool could be utilized so that people can sort of see, you know, the basics, the bare minimum, this is what we would have to do to bring our building into compliance. But then all these extra things could be yep. added on, you know, and and it might be that, you know, um, that's, you know, you have your base option and your second option, but then, you know, with the second option, there might be things that we could, like, do without up front, you know, something like that, so that people can sort of get a sense for the, the cost and, and what the amenities would translate to. So moving forward, um, how does, yeah, what do you think, Donna? Do you want a motion? Or, well, yeah, sure, that'd be great. <laughs> <laughs> that'd be wonderful. <laughs> Well, I, I make a motion that for the January 7th public meeting. To, that hold, we, to hold one. To hold one. <laughs> and at that meeting, we are to hold <coughs> that option one gets pr presented as a base project. And it'd be good if it's visual as well as uh, actual listed items. And then two and three get combined as the second option. So there's just two options. Real base, and then this the second option. Within the second option, I think it's great if we had them do little postums of these things. What do you like the most? You know, I don't think you want to get into all the numbers, but you could. Uh, but that the idea of option one and option two is to present the public with information and maybe some choices about option two. I like to, like I'd like to see if they have um, this is not part of the motion John I'd like to see if the fitness fitness and weight room equipment I mean do they really want a spin room is that how they'd use that or would they want something else so I'd like to see some postum interactivity that way so on this January 7th public meeting I'd like them to have two options the one and the combination of two and three and a way to express what they like the most about two and three second so, we have a second. Is a part of your motion um, all the procedural things pr to move forward? Is that we're moving forward to March town okay. meeting. Okay. okay. Um, motion and discussion, or motion and seconded. Is there any further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Uh, okay. Great. Thank you. Um, thank you for all of your work. Sure. Thank you for your responsiveness. I um, want to acknowledge the time. It's 10. I would think we should still have a budget conversation. Uh, I would presently be aiming for about 10.30. What do you think, Are team? you going to make it? You're going to collapse, Lee. I'm good. <laughs> I'll be fine. Where's the chocolate? Exactly. The chocolate? No, I'll Where's be all, I'll be okay. chocolate? Right. <laughs> okay. Uh, all right, so on to our budget discussion. Um, and actually, Laura, uh, Rose, since you're here, was there a particular item that you wanted to talk about? Or? Drive carefully. Oh, okay. Oh, have a good night. 
the, the feet. Oh, you down. should go have a conversation with this fellow over here. Oh, no, it's okay. Good. So you're not here for a specific item. Okay. Cool. Great. Okay. Okay. So, um, all right. Oh, gosh. I, not with the cold. That's <laughs> yeah, sometimes we want soup, not... Mm, all right. Okay, but um, the budget. Uh, so... Um, yeah, so so I don't have an additional presentation, unless you want me to go through what I did last week. Um, we could put up the spreadsheet if you like, okay. uh, in which case I'd be happy to move down there to do that. Um, or you have your budget books. Uh, we have our team here, so I think it would be helpful for us to know what issues you'd like to know more information about, what you're thinking about certain things, where you'd like us, you know, j just to walk through the, the process a little bit more. We've always got this bond discussion that's floating, but you have a you have a workshop scheduled for January 8. Then we have a meeting for January 15, which is not our normal night, but that would be our first round of public hearings normally on the budget, bonds, et cetera. And then the following week, Thursday the 23rd, would be the fi second public hearings on everything and then when you finally vote. So, you know, how you want to allocate that time uh, is important. And, and, you know, we did move a few things to the 8th tonight that were originally scheduled. So uh, just keep that in mind that we will be revisiting some issues and um, hopefully we can have have clearer uh, information on some of those things. Um, so my uh, gut about this is to just give, give every council member an opportunity to say uh, uh, whether you'd like to keep all the things, subtract anything, add anything, um, what is your what is your inclination? Um, and so keeping it kind of general, knowing that we don't have to decide tonight, um, but just to take a temperature of everybody, where are you at, what are you thinking, what are you inclined towards at this point? Um, does anybody feel ready to share something like that? Um, okay, go ahead, Donna, and then we'll I mean, go Connor. The staff did such a great job. <coughs> I actually reduced the Montpelier Development Corp to 75,000. And I added 10,000 for Ashbor. And I circled the rec center at the 300,000. And I, that's why I had the question about the capital improvement plan and that Bill's going to give us a report on. But those are my three things. One reduced, and I add the ash bore and the rec. I want to write those down. But I don't know that, that the rec could possibly be done in, I think, in FY21. Can you, but can you just say those, ooh, can you say those again? Montpelier Development Corps, mm -hmm. I reduced by 25. I made it mm -hmm. 75,000. It was a hundred thousand. Ashbor was ten thousand, mm -hmm. and then the number that Bill had for the rec uh, okay. bond was three hundred thousand. Okay. And my thinking of the development core, we have flat funded them at a hundred thousand. At some point, I thought they were supposed to start getting some other funds, but maybe. Right. And, and I guess my response to that is um, obviously we can have them in and meet with them. I think that'd be appropriate. But when we created them, we made a five-year commitment. Oh, we did. Okay. To, Put it to, back. Well, I mean, it wasn't a contract, but it was a five-year yeah. commitment that we would fund them. And I think this is year four. So that was our, you know, when we talked yep. about it as a team. I thought it was, was three, but yeah, mm -hmm. that's fine. So. Fine. Connor. <coughs> yeah, actually, <coughs> pretty similar to Donna. Uh, just going on the MDC there. I mean, there's got to be vacancy savings. We've had an empty position, an empty office for at least four months there. So I think it would be a good idea to invite them in and actually see what their budget stands up to compared to the appropriation there, right? And if they have something extra in the coffers, I'd rather throw 25K to something else. Uh, so I'd just like to see those numbers anyways. Uh, and with the idea we would keep a hundred thousand commitment in the future. Um, other ones, legislator welcome reception. I love legislators. Uh, we've got a lot of things pending over at the state house now. I'd rather convert that into an information session, or maybe we invite them over to Cheese and Crackers to City Hall, where they can hear about rail, they can hear about microtransit, they can hear about non-U.S. citizen voting. Um, and along those lines, I'd really like to double down on the lobbyist position. Because I think for $10,000, and it could be a pretty narrow scope there, having eyes and ears in the building 24-7 uh, while they're in session, 
uh, could yield some pretty good results <coughs> as far as tapping into the capital bill, appropriations bill, we've got stuff cooking in the transportation bill, um, and also just advocating on some of these issues. So I, again, just really want to double down on that lobbyist contract, uh, which I know we won't get the world for $10,000, but it, it, it would go a long way, I think, so. Um, USS Montpelier, I'm kind of ambivalent on, but I can be convinced either way. Um, just initial stuff. Anybody else ready to share? If you're ready, Glenn, go ahead. Uh, I don't think I'm really ready, but I might as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, uh, I'm glad that we're talking about the Montpelier Development Corporation. One of my questions was going to be, because I, I remembered that it was five years, but I didn't remember where it, when it started. So I think, I think this is four. Yeah, I think that that is a, a worthwhile conversation to have. I think it's um, also fair to say that uh, they, <coughs> while they were meant to try to find uh, sources of funding, they've also had a fair amount of turnover in the first few years. So it makes sense that they might have had trouble uh, fulfilling some of those goals. Um, <laughs> But it would be great to be able to find a little extra funds um, somewhere. I also uh, would love to uh, find space for at least some of the Homelessness Task Force recommendations. I think that uh, they've done um, really great work. And some of those uh, items are very, very small and uh, would have a, a huge impact on, on some of the people who need it most. So I think that, that it would be um, great to have some of that in. Um, yeah, sure. Go ahead. Yeah, just see the Washington County tax box is in check. <laughs> is, it, is that an optional thing? I no. no, no. <laughs> it's a bill. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, over here. Um, Ashley. I. I, I mean, I think I've made my thoughts pretty clear over, over the while. However, what I would say is this. <coughs> I understand that as a practical reality right now, we have no choice but to pay <coughs> increased health insurance premiums. And I accept that because I cannot change that for this year. But what I can do is be super loud about how fundamentally abhorrent it is that the city of Montpelier taxpayers have to eat a 25% increase to premiums because we have employees who utilize health insurance as it was intended. Um, and so while I understand that there is nothing that can seemingly be done to change this year, I would really encourage the city to plan going forward for a way out of that because that's a race to nowhere. I mean, it's, it's literally a race to the bottom at this point. A 25% increase this year coupled with, you know, what's, what's the next year going to be? I know we haven't seen a 25% increase in, <coughs> in previous years, but a as someone who almost died, uh, medical care is a critical component to what we do as a city and how we treat our employees. And uh, I don't believe that that means that we have to sacrifice care for our employees, nor do I think that that means that our residents need to, every year, simply accept whatever Blue Cross Blue Shield says is going to be their increase. So whatever, um, you know, I, I know that there are some options and there are some questions about amending some statutes that could potentially allow us to purchase into other places, but I would really encourage the city to spend effort there because, I, I mean, human beings, <coughs> we break sometimes and we need to see people that know how to fix us and that I don't think should mean that taxes go up, you know, to, to accommodate a 25% increase to a corporation that is still able to pay its executives quite well um, and, and frankly sort of leave the city in a position <laughs> where we're making choices about cutting services to literally people who are sleeping outside, right, and to other residents to accommodate um, for Blue Cross Blue Shield's demand and, and frankly hostage type situation. So I will leave it at that. I'm going to step off that soapbox, but I would really encourage the city to look at other alternatives to Blue Cross because this is not a sustainable mechanism by which we can plan a city budget or, or you know, continue any sort of long-term financial planning. Okay, thank you. Do you have anything else to say about it? Any other, anything else to say about it? 
Um, <laughs> that's my big one. But um, I, too, would encourage the, the council and the city to um, engage in a little bit more value-based budgeting when it comes to um, when it comes to services that uh, that people need to be here. And I know that personal responsibility and accountability is part of that conversation, but part of the trade-off to me of living in a community like Montpelier is that um, while eventually one does get <coughs> priced out for life reasons, because that's the way the world works, um, there are services and people and resources in this community like I have not experienced myself in other places. Um, and making sure that we continue our commitment to those that are the most vulnerable among us is the most important thing that I think that I've done in my time here. Right. Other thoughts? I'm not very far along yet. I, I uh, agreed with uh, Donna's email that the uh, <clears throat> the city's done a great job at presenting something that, uh, you know, where we are with, as the city and as I look at what city government does, I think we need to keep doing basically everything the city's doing. We're, we're providing... <laughs> <coughs> essential services for uh, the quality of <coughs> the city that we have. Um, <coughs> with the Emerald Ash Borer thing, I, it wasn't clear to me that uh, the tree board was asking for $10,000 uh, $10, this year. My sense was, and I think we should explore this, my sense was that they were thinking, well, you know, it hasn't uh, been, it hasn't hasn't been as aggressive as they were afraid it was going to be, so maybe we have enough in the uh, in the bank for that now. And so I think it's worth exploring that to see where they're coming from. Um, with regard to the uh, my my biggest question is really what uh, we can uh, what we can and should and need to provide for. Uh, Homeless services. I think that uh, the the proposal that we've seen seems a little more vague than uh, it really should be to to get me to say, yeah, this is uh, money we need to provide, and and if we and if we vote the money, we know what uh, what it's going to be what's going to be done with it, um, and whether there's a trade-off between a, a social worker from Washington County Mental Health versus someone else, so that's, <coughs> that's another question. But So I, I, I may have more thoughts, but that's where I'm, what I'm thinking now. So being new to this, still formulating thoughts, and there were some things, like I don't know what the USS Montpelier is for $1,000, or why cemetery flags cost $1,500. It's fascinating, but um, I mean, overall, I agree with a lot of the comments people have made um, so far, and really appreciate that this budget does maintain a lot of really critical services. I think the city's doing a great job with and is very responsive to the strategic planning we did and trying to um, incorporate some new programs and positions and um, looking at the challenges like DPW faced this year and trying to address that. I appreciate the, that that's been built in. Um, you know, if I had my all of my wishes, I would definitely want to see the energy plan funded, and I know there was some looking at the efficiency funding or some, some opportunities for so possibly I think, funding I think money. we can say that we've got funds for the energy plan. I meant to yes. mention that at the beginning. It was just the hour. I forgot. We, there is money in the capital plan that we can identify for that. Yay. So, um, so can probably take that one off the add -on. Great. Um, I, I, Unless you I, don't I, want to do that. That seems really great to me. Um, I do. I would love to see if we can find some money for the... <laughs> homelessness task force I think I agree that I'd love to see more details and some more thinking um, but they've done amazing work on short 
time frame of really trying to come up with some concrete ideas and things that really help real people every day in our community. So would love to see what we could do there. Um, and I do think it's worth exploring the idea of the lobbyists, just knowing that if there are state dollars to be found to help us do some of this important work, um, you only know that if you have someone in there um, advocating for you. And even things like the healthcare issues that um, that are you know a huge part of our budget, and you know if we could get on have the option of being part of the um, state exchange, for example, and that kind of advocacy to give us um, more opportunities and options that do have big impacts on our budget, I think could actually be money. Really, it could pay for itself. Uh, so I also have a question about the cemetery flags. What is that? <laughs> Why do they need flags? Um, I believe that this is for the Veterans, the veterans Fund, yeah. veterans and they put flags on the Veterans Cemeteries. Here, we'll get the specifics, but... Uh. Uh, Prevention or Finance Director. Um, <clears throat> You're still here? No. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, no, 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 no. Trust me, it got off my mind. <laughs> um, the uh, local uh, VFW post uh, does a number of uh, functions throughout the year. Um, the tally that they provide us in support of that request for a contribution is between $7,500 and $9,000, I believe. Um, so this is the city's contribution towards a greater effort. I will send you copies of uh, what the breakdown of that is. The, the flags is, is a part of that, where they decorate for Memorial Day and they put flags in the cemetery um, to honor the veterans. Um, it's kind of a community support, but the account line has stayed as cemetery flags. It is not truly descriptive of everything that's involved in that. Well, and did we contribute towards this last year? We yep. have contributed oh, yeah. for, so, yeah, for years and years and years. I'm going to ask this question out of ignorance. Why mm -hmm. do we keep buying new flags? Is that? No, it's just a, it's an annual appropriation that we provide to them for, for now whether they're buying new flags each year or not, I don't, I can't tell you the specifics. It's just part of a, uh, okay. it, their expense portfolio that they, for their various activities that has been a budgeted line item for as long as I've been okay. here. Okay. Well, fair enough. So we could change the name. Yeah, that, I think the name that, is that would, misleading. that would be helpful. Mm -hmm. I was picturing flags that yeah. just saying cemetery here, you know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> doesn't make sense. So. No, I, I think what they do is they actually go out and put a flag on the grave of oh, yeah. everyone yeah. who's yes. a veteran right. in all the uh, right. cemeteries okay. in Montpelier, and mm -hmm. and they don't go out later and collect them. They they stay there yeah. permanently, mm -hmm. and, uh, okay. you know, this is one of those things uh, that <coughs> it, it's kind of indicative in my mind of like a, what's the culture of the city of Montpelier? You know, kind of like the smoking ban downtown that was proposed, kind of like the toy run. This is kind of in the same thing that uh, these are cultural markers for parts of the population that are not reflected on the city council, mm -hmm. but are, are very important for the people who are, for whom they're important. Okay, and well, so I would be loath to save money by taking that out. I am convinced. <laughs> Thank you. That was very helpful. Thanks, Todd. And I, and I guess, well, so nobody specifically asked, but really connected to that is the USS Montpelier. Obviously, we, we have the... the, um, the um, Museum. Museum, thank you, <laughs> upstairs. <laughs> uh, but this also helps contribute when the... Uh, you know, the sailors come in March Fernandez. in the July 3rd. Um, they, it costs a lot more than this, but this is our contribution to their transportation and housing and to, to bring them to Montpelier and be, can keep that connection between um, between them. And it's been a, a fruitful connection. You know, they've, uh, they've come in our time of need in 92, the flood, the whole ship, they sent a whole crew up to help people. Huh? And then when we were... Uh, in 2007, with the flood scare, they let us know that if they needed resources, they would send, you know, people from their ship up. Uh, but again, it's it's uh, something I think that is important to an, an aspect of the community. The welcome legislators reception again. That is actually you. You all know what that is, and that's put on by yeah. um, actually the Chamber of Commerce. And again, this is our our contribution to it. It's not the full cost of the event. Uh, I I'd argue that it. While a lobbyist is also potentially important, this has 
I think, built a lot of positive relations between the city and the legislature over the years, as well as a way to say thank you to our volunteers. Uh, I, I think it's a small investment for a lot of goodwill. Go ahead, I'm glad that you mentioned that because it is, inv volunteers are invited. Mm. And, it, and it is a party, so it's a real positive thing. And sometimes mm. you get into good conversations, but it is a feel good for a change. So. Uh, but we could still have them here for four. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. Um, oh, can I say one other thing? <coughs> Just so, I don't know if Jack was on the council the first time John Snell came to us with the ash borer. And I believe we started out with like $8,000, and I know Ann supported it, and we got to 10. But his number was in the 100,000s. And so the 10 is to be constantly steady state to put it aside, because when it does hit us, the expense is huge. Um, so, so that's why the 10,000 to me is important. To that end, um, Alec, you're, do you have anything to say about the, uh, this 10,000 for ash borers? Not to put you on the spot, but I'm putting you on the spot. Yeah. Get a chance to talk. Show up. Um, just to keep it brief, Todd and I have been working since last week to figure out what has been put into that fund, what has been spent, and once we figure that out, I'll be able to calibrate the request properly for this year. So. Sorry, but that's I think fine. just put it off for now. So that's a to be determined amount. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. That's helpful. Well, Thank John you. John Snell won't like you. <laughs> <laughs> I, might, I might ask for more. I mean, I didn't say I was going to ask for less. <laughs> uh, so uh, speaking for myself, uh, unless there's other things people want to add. Um, oh yeah. Okay. Go ahead. I, I think it's already like written down somewhere, but I, I would just want to be explicit that the Green Mountain Transit forty thousand dollars would preferably be for micro transit, and then we could always reallocate it later, I imagine. Yes, that's, that's correct. Through. That's correct. the intent. Okay. Well, they're going to reallocate it, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so for myself, uh, I have the, I'm glad you brought up the question about the um, rec bond, Donna, because um, I also have that same question. It's just a, um, such a large figure that, you know, thinking about how we, like when does that kick in, and how, how do we talk about it? Because Right. So there's, so there's the details. I mean, we'd figure out when we actually were floating the bond. Uh, you know, the first year is actually 100000 and it becomes 300000 when we finally paid the first full principal and interest. Mm -hmm. So we, we would build that into the plan. To some extent, it, it, it is a, a policy decision. So the way we've, the way we've set up our capital plan, is that we have, and if you go to we, our books, um, and you don't, all don't have to, but I, I can find some <laughs> talk uh, somewhat intelligently. If you go to page 17 of your budget book, you can see that, um, so we've got 2.4 million proposed for this year total in capital spending. Some of that is from our equipment spending, the 515, and then the remainder is is what we call annual money versus debt dollars. And as you know, that's been the system. So um, as we've had these, this total fund, they've all been in together. And, and as we've increased our money and debt has either leveled or dropped, that's allowed the annual funding to grow. As you can see pretty substantially, even just in 10 years, it's gone from 434 to 1.2 million. In, in what we can use on any given year. So the, the simplest thing would be to say, okay, you know, we're gonna add that 300,000 in this debt column, and that's gonna reduce the annual dollar column. Now, before we totally freak out, we look and we say, well, look, you know, it's already dropping a couple hundred thousand dollars over the next couple of years with what we already have on the books. And remember that the, the parking garage debt probably would not fall into this because it's TIF and user fees would be in the parking fund. This would be included in here. Um, but even if you took it all, and I'm not, I'm not saying that cutting annual funding is a good thing, but even if you took it all and, and you know, already next year we've got a $100,000 drop in bond. If you see from 627 this year down to 529 next year. So you'd be knocking $200,000 off of 
our projection for next year. So that 1.4 projected would still be 1.2, which is not that far off from where we are right now, $50,000 or lower. So we could, for example, choose to put another 25 or 50,000, you know, we could choose to slowly build up that fund to try to offset it. We could choose to say, all right, we're going to float this bond and we're going to put 100,000 on the tax rate and the rest build into here. Or we could say, we're just going to absorb it all into pre-plan and it would, it would affect the taxes because it would be part of this fund. Yeah. But it wouldn't necessarily be a tax increase. It would be in lieu of doing something else. So the taxpayer would feel it, you know. Yeah. It'd be three hundred thousand dollars of dollar, you know, redirected. Mm -hmm. But that's, I mean, if if you all didn't make any decision <coughs> based on our debt policy, that it would go in here and reduce. That's the default okay. that that would happen to it. Okay. Well, that. Did I say that at all intelligently? <laughs> It made sense to me. I think the question is like, how do we communicate about that? Right. And to be fair, I mean, this project may not, we may decide that it is not for March and we may, right. um, we may decide. And, and so then it would that all out. And, and even if it was for March, you know, there's no reason we couldn't recalibrate this and show how that looks. Yep. And project that out. Right. And actually we've got a, we've got some future years to put more specific numbers in anyway. So, okay. Uh, okay, so that was uh, one thing. Um, I would also like to fund some part of the homelessness task force. I'm not sure how much um, that is, and probably. Well, I, I will tell you that um, I I'm, I am interested in the the general um, purpose fund that that last thing. And I know it's pretty vague, but I think it might. Uh, have some potential to be matching funds, have potential to be, uh, you know, incidental costs. And um, I, I think of that, and, and I know we have yet to have that conversation more robustly, but thinking about the energy committee um, that has $5,000 and, and we spend it, you know, we find things to do with that money that um, furthers our purpose. Um, so I guess I'm thinking about it as in, uh, in uh, parity with uh, the energy committee. Um, but then uh, beyond that, um, I do worry about the the locker policy, um, and but anyway, I guess I would rather talk about lockers and porta potties if there is a really robust, specific, um, detailed plan. Uh, of course, that's easy for me to say. Uh, you know, it's <laughs> just a little chicken and egg there. Uh, but then uh, beyond that, I I'm interested in the lobbyist. Um, and uh, potentially uh, hearing more about um, the ash borer. So uh, that is, I would, I would still like to see us try to come in under 4% if possible. Uh, that, again, I'm speaking for myself, uh, but, but, and, and we'll, we'll see. That, that's it for, so for just, me, yeah. Just so people know, I just was fooling with this, and so on adding $27,000 to this would get you to 3.9%. Okay. So, that, I mean, I just, that's what you're working with. Um, if people agree, what should, they might, y'all might not. So I want, yeah. um, on the homeless, so mm -hmm. you were not in, including $10,000 for extending the shelter time. I'm you were only wanting to add some money for the contingencies. Yeah, I didn't I didn't I didn't get to say this uh, part, but I was I'm worried that the fifteen thousand dollars extension of the homeless time should maybe come out of uh, the community fund. It's if there, if there's an ask from the um, popular community fund for as an allocation for a good Samaritan and that's not enough, then that's where that money should be expanded. Um, but they into. they missed the opportunity I, this year. Yeah, I know. Well, and the deadline's gone. I'm I'm open to further yeah. discussion about that. If yeah, no, I was just interested because that's yeah. I I don't want to to set a precedent right now that we're going to give ten thousand dollars or fifteen thousand dollars every year. I yeah. just once we do that, it's it's there. And do you I, mean for the extension? Yes. Yes. Well, for, yeah. Yeah, I, yeah. And then we can't do anything else, so that's right. Yeah. Well, and, and how if they were going to go to the community fund to say that this is the appropriate amount and the appropriate place to to get that kind of extension mm -hmm. money, um, just the timing of that is yeah. is off, um, as you're saying. So anyway, that that is it for me. So one possibility is that given all of our input, um, well, maybe from this point for our next meeting. Uh, we get into the nitty-gritty of hammering out 
uh, the numbers. Is there specific, you know, we've got all our departments here, is there specific information from them or concerns about anything that you'd like them to be prepping for? <laughs> I'm sure they'll stay because they, they like this more than, and they like <laughs> life itself. Yeah, but, 1030. Uh, <laughs> I, I would. But it would be good if we could have them doing work for you if that's what you'd like. Um, this is just reiterating a little bit, um, just for a chief Acus, just thinking about. Uh, um, I know we, we just spoke to it a little bit tonight about uh, how a uh, social worker would be different from um, the street outreach uh, proposal from the homelessness task force, but um, just being able to. Um, point at, if, if there was like some memo or something about that, I don't know, just something that I can point at to say this is how this is different. That I would find that helpful. Um, anything else? No. I, I'm going to say yes. no, because I, I support everything that every one of the departments uh, has asked for. And so, <laughs> so I don't feel a need to... Uh, so good job, yeah. I don't feel a need for them to <laughs> be coming here and saying, uh, justify it, because I'm, I'm already there. The, the ash borer thing that uh, <laughs> Donna raised is a good question. I, I do have one other question um, for Donna. Did w is in the current proposed budget, did that include, were we able to figure out uh, converting an internal, uh, converting a, the, the municipal trash collection to being an internal position? Okay, and so that is included in the proposed budget. Okay, great. All right, anything else? Okay, thank you. Thank you all for staying. We appreciate you all. Especially those of you that don't work here yet. <laughs> okay, so we are gonna move on to Council reports. Donna, do you, are you up for starting? Okay. Well, the Parks Commission approved a kids' pump track along Cumming Street. And there's a, a lot of details to that. And they're, they're, it's right now where DPW dumps snow. And they're moving in partnership with them and the Conservation Commission to make sure that what they're replacing will not erode more. So they're really looking at it very carefully. What was the middle word you said, kids what track? Pump, pump track. It's, you know, it's, um, it, it has challenges that you would find on a mountain bike trail, the Fat, fat Tarmac mountain bike trail, but it's at the size of a portion for kids. So they start to have some maneuverability around the earth, maybe, Alex, or, oh, oh, there we go, I got a biker, <laughs> come. Um, it's, 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 it's going to be dirt, uh, it's a series of rolling hills. Yeah. And so with, with, by pumping, they're not pedaling, they're getting, the, they're using balance and momentum. And, and it's, uh, it, it's kind of goes back to the roots of the 1970s. I was growing up and riding a BMX bike, bicycle motocross mm -hmm. back in the day. Uh, but it's a great activity for kids, uh, and they're great skills, and for adults too. They're, they're, um, so well, anyway. this one is for kids, Tony. You can't use it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like a figure eight. It's sort of, not quite, but it's like a figure eight kind of track. Yeah, it's all a confined space. Yes. So it's not like the, the meandering trails of, that we have in multiple streets. Right. But it's part of the North Branch Park Trail that goes behind Cummings Street, Cummings Housing. Uh, so that was decided. They've also expanded the fat bikes into Hubbard Park. And I'm also on the Regional Planning Commission, besides the TAC, I'm on their Basin Clean Water Plan. And there's a new legislation that was ap approved this last year, and it's Act 76, that actually is going to be setting up around between 50 to $60 million for clean water. And of course, out the gate in 2001 is Lake Champagne and Lake Minas. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Meant for me, Garg? It's the one up north, the big one. <laughs> but slowly over time, all the other waterways and basins do get some money. But the interesting thing, they're now looking at having the clean water service provider be the Regional Planning Commission. And they'll get all this funding, all this grant money, and then they'll assess the projects and they'll supervise it. So the state is once more 
subcontracting with a non nonprofit entity to do its work. And I'll keep you posted on it, but it's uh, very interesting. So is this potential money for us to oh, uh, I hope so. be aggressive on our CSO project? It, yes, but we're not as high on the spectrum as other heavy loaders. They're really going after the heavy loaders. Mm -hmm. and whether that's farm, uh, railroad tracks is another place that's a lot of pollution that comes but, out of. Yeah, I mean, agriculture is really the biggest yeah. of all. Yep. And general stuff off the roadways is really heavy. But, yeah. Cool. That's all. And, Ashley, <laughs> it's been interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Whether we agree or not, it's always interesting. <laughs> Thank you for serving. <laughs> yeah, right, not much. I guess I should announce I will be running for re-election. Oh, did you say that? Um, oh, did you? you no, no, I didn't. Go ahead. No, I'll, I'll take the limelight here. It's, uh, <laughs> I think I just miss uh, hanging out with you guys so much that I, you know, I've got the power for lust for another couple of years. I definitely will miss our colleagues from District 3 here very much. So I won't go into too much because I love the campaign and you'll be getting a lot of literature the next couple months. So. <laughs> Thanks so much. Um, I don't have much to say tonight. I'll be at Baguitos tomorrow morning as usual, 8.30 to 9.30. Uh, I want to apologize that I haven't managed to get to the ha homelessness task force meetings the last couple of weeks. This is the uh, craziest season at my day job and my coworkers would murder me if I were not there in the middle of a Wednesday. Um, and uh, Ashley, I'm sorry to see you go. Uh, and uh, I thought I was going to beat you out. Uh, but <laughs> as, as usual, you're, you're, you're ahead of me. So uh, uh, yes, thank you for your service. Leave her for last. Oh, do you want to yeah, go see her? Yeah, OK. Yeah, yeah, fair. Yeah, fair. Yeah, yeah, my my only thing tonight. I just wanted to also <coughs> thank Ashley. You bring up such important, pertinent perspective, um, and it will be missed. And thank you for your service. And keep in touch. And hope to see you here in other capacities. Oh, yes. <laughs> I'm sure we will. <laughs> thank you, Jack. I have nothing to say other than I appreciate all the work and energy that Ashley has brought to this job. And thanks. We'll still be in touch and take care of yourself. Yeah. Um, so f I, uh, for those of you who have not yet seen, um, I tendered my resignation um, effective at the close of this meeting. Um, I did send out a statement, which I would be happy to read. Right now, I got a little emotional. It's a little hard. It's OK, okay though. I uh, write to you all today to announce my resignation from the Montpelier City Council as District 3 Councilor, effective at the close of tonight's meeting. As a community leader, I believe it is not only my duty, but my obligation to be candid with myself, my constituents, and my community. As I reflect on the myriad of complex and incredibly challenging personal, professional, and life circumstances and shifts in my own life as of late, I find my mind continually coming back to the importance of making time and space for self-care in the healing and rebuilding process. Despite my own dogged determination to, do my, to be my best self in all that I do, I realize now that my life looks very different than it did a year ago. The hardest part of this time of reflection for me has been the realization that in order for me to keep doing everything that I do and doing it with the care, love, and integrity I pride myself <laughs> on taking in my service of others, I would not be able to make self-care and healing a priority. At this juncture in my life, I need to focus on regrouping and focusing on my own overall health so that I'm able to continue my advocacy work in the long term. Seeing the many amazing opportunities and possibilities that are coming together for Montpelier and that have come together for Montpelier since I joined the council is one of the most meaningful experiences of my life. I am proud of the resilience, commitment, and dedication I've observed from community members, city officials, and city staff in Montpelier over the past almost <coughs> three years. I, too, Ashley, just want to be, um, just, I'm so appreciative of your time 
and we've we've really benefited from your perspective, from your um, from your push, and I I love that you um, called it a push and not a shove. Most people call it a shove. <laughs> no, I mean you're bringing a a, a very strong uh, perspective that you pride yourself in, and I, I think that's really valuable. Um, and I love that you are um, willing to disagree, um, and again do so um, gracefully. So. Um, thank you for, for that. That's really important. And I want to thank Arnie for my piece of coal <laughs> All right. that he actually did deliver. And I made sure to pick the heart-shaped one out of the bunch. <coughs> but this is from the rec center. And I think everybody on the council has a piece. Yeah. It's, I, I was going to say, if not, there's they may have bottle. stopped here, but there is one for everyone. <laughs> <laughs> We so appreciate you. Some of us. Someone's hogging all the coal <laughs> over there. Um, <laughs> on a You're logistic. Porter. <laughs> on a logistic level, um, I want to also recognize that we interrupted the conversation about the homelessness task force tonight, and I know you had more things to say yes, about it. And send a note. so please do um, send those comments. And yeah. too, you know, if 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 <laughs> you know time and healing allows if you want to weigh in on anything else we'd certainly welcome that so oh i know how to find y'all okay. just remember your time two minutes <laughs> <laughs> you know i have become very effective in life at getting it all out quick <laughs> i'm used to being cut off so i've learned there you go uh all right so uh on to other other things um i <laughs> This is from, yeah, anyway. Uh, uh, what is the status of the dirt pile? One <laughs> <laughs> over here? It, over there. This coming week, um, by the end of this week or early next week, um, we're just. By Christmas? Last, last I heard, um, we were just negotiating the price with Casella. Um, okay. It, it's going to New York. Oh, wow. Um, so it was a little shift in um, where they were going to bring it. And I didn't think to ask Corey today. Okay. So early next week. Yes. Okay. Great. Uh, wonderful. Um, okay. Well, that is actually it for me. Uh, John. And in fact, we got an email from Corey today. Sorry to interrupt, but he just said. Um, the this hauling of the stockpile will begin on Thursday morning. So assuming that means tomorrow morning. Trucks can only make one run a day, so it'll probably take about a week to remove the entire pile and the holiday next week will extend it a little longer. I'm estimating it should be completed by the end of next week or early the following week. Okay. But starting tomorrow. That's it's a Thursday. So yeah. Okay. Um, Great. Well, thanks, Ashley. We're going to miss you. And I can't believe I'm losing both my council reps here. It's like, it anarchy. Is what it's like. That sounds like an opening, Mr. Odom. <laughs> I, I, as of one of the last charter changes, Bill Hatch Act me, so I can't run, I'm afraid. <laughs> well, you could run for this. <laughs> and I couldn't take the job if I won. There you go. Um, also, just really briefly, uh, finally, I've been working on this for a while. I got the the formal okay from the uh, Secretary of State to uh, proceed with a, uh, a blockchain pilot project for securing election data uh, that Montpelier has been picked out for that, I mean, with everything else we're doing and with everything the Secretary of State's doing, we're going to have some of the most secure, at least in the, during the length of the pilot, some of the most secure uh, election data in the world, I think. Um, this is a pilot can be done by a, a, a big company based um, in Switzerland, actually, that, um, and this is not blockchain voting, it's just blockchain data security. Um, but they do uh, cybersecurity for NATO, for Department of Defense. They run the election security for the entirety of Estonia. So these are, these are some, some serious players, and it's going to be pretty cool to pilot uh, uh, an American uh, product for them here. Uh, just a couple things. First of all, um, thank you, Ashley. Anyone who who does these positions, um, it's a lot of work and time and emotional and energy and everything else. I appreciate it, and uh, you've been fun to work with. So fun. 
<laughs> yes. <laughs> I wish everyone that's worked with me over my career would pick the word fun. <laughs> well, remember, I'm a 25-year city manager, so my idea of fun isn't <laughs> the same fair, as most people. <laughs> Maybe I'm just wise beyond my years. <laughs> um, uh, over the next couple of weeks, I, so you know, we have three weeks before the next council meeting, but the, the holidays really are disrupting the next two. So while on one hand we have a lot of things to to do before the next meeting, we just be clear that there, we won't have uh, everybody on board all the time to get it all together. So we will be coming back out of the holidays and then jumping right into this January 7 hearing. So note that. And to that point, because of Jamie's departure, we are a little short in City Hall, so we're actually. Cameron and Jane and I are going to meet tomorrow to sort out who's going to be on first which day. But uh, you know there may be some, and I don't know what the clerk's office looks like over the next couple of weeks. But um, you know, I, yeah. So I, just mentioning that. Lowered our expectations. Right. Well, just to be clear, so you can reach us, but just understand there will be some different people are going to be different places. Um, I just want to acknowledge that we need to be super intentional about advertising the heck out of the January yeah, 7th I, meeting. Oh, yeah. That's, um, yes, sorry. Thank got you. that. And, and yes, so that, that's on our list. Um, and then for those of you for, with whom I have regular Monday meetings, I assume we are planning not to meet the next two Mondays. So unless, yeah, just saying that out loud. Um, and that's, I, you know, we don't have anything else that we need to talk about at quarter of 11. Yeah. <laughs> Are we doing 6.30 on uh, the 7th? Uh, do you mean for the meeting time? Mm -hmm. Public meeting. The public Seven. meeting. 7? What do you think is? January 7th. Oh, January 7th. Meeting on the building. Right. right. So He's asking what time it's going to start. 6.30. 6.30. Let's go with 6.30. Um, we have the rec, not the rec center, I'm sorry, the senior center um, has very graciously offered their space for this so that we can, if people want to go see the rec center, we can just walk them across. Huh. So um, uh, that I'll let them know that that's the time. Okay, great. I don't think there will be. Okay. Uh, well, I'm going to call the meeting adjourned at 1047.